Black Jupiter, more like you're watching Black Jupiter, with me, Agent Random. As someone that spends more time than your grandmother playing and talking about a Square Enix game from 2007, I've come across a lot of interesting secrets hidden in The World Ends With You. And as far as I can tell, nobody here on www.wethoughtambientmodewasagoodidea.com seems to have covered that, so I'm here today to cover every easter egg, reference, and interesting hidden goodie in The World Ends With You. We're covering story, gameplay, and even those thought fragments that nobody ever reads. We're doing Doing it all! And not just the first game, oh no siree. You see that time code? We're covering the first game, anime adaptation, and the sequel. Originally each of those segments were released as their own videos, but this right here is a compilation of all three with a few changes like new easter eggs and a larger video file. If you've seen the original releases but have been itching for a rewatch or haven't seen the originals yet at all, this is the version to watch. Since we're covering the whole series, there will, in fact, be spoilers for the whole series. Each section will still have its video's own spoiler warning, which I'm leaving in because I like them and I can do what I want. If we're all clear on that, then sit tight, buckle up, and here we go. First up, the original game. Specifically, we'll be looking at the DS version and its Switch port. I do not own the mobile one, and I'm not paying $18 just to watch one extra cutscene that probably doesn't have any easter eggs in it, okay? Cool. I should also note that we are specifically looking at the English localization of the game. This is noteworthy since it contains a number of references not present in Japanese. The reverse is probably also true, but reading and writing in one language is hard enough you really expect me to do too. If anyone who knows Japanese knows any Japanese exclusive references, throw them in the comments and we'll throw you a heart. With that out of the way, let's begin! After this legally mandated spoiler warning. This video contains spoilers for all versions of the original World Ends of You video game. If you do not have a desire to be spoiled on anything from either story or gameplay, then please ask yourself what you're doing on this channel. Black Jupiter is not liable for any information that you wish you did not know. If you agree to these terms, please like this video, subscribe twice, and hit the bell three freaking times. Anyone who can name that reference gets a cookie. The first place to start on our journey is with Neku. He wears headphones 24-7 to block out the world. This is inspired from a Japanese proverb about some monkeys. One of these monkeys embodies the concept of hear no evil and covers its ears. Neku is this monkey. Hear no evil along with the other three, see no evil, speak no evil, and do no evil are all represented in the irregular note pin set. And while I'm on the topic of those pins, they are named swift as the wind, hushed as the wood, fierce as the flame, and stalwart as the mount. These are all part of a battle philosophy from Sun Tzu's Art of War. There's also an interesting design tidbit not just with his headphones, but with what they're connected to. According to at Roxas Pro Skater, Neku's tampon of an MP3 player is based off the NWS200 series from 2006. Not long after starting, the game's opening will play, and it Taiki spoils the entire game but moves so fast that who can even tell what's happening? Me and my pause button, that's who. The opening starts with Neku running for his life from some killer frogs. On his way, he runs past all three of his future partners. Shiki looking shocked at not looking Shiki, Beat probably running to find Rhyme or something, and Joshua who smiles at Neku as he runs by. I'm not going to explain why Joshua smiled here. If you're watching this video, then you should already know that he just does that sometimes. The next noteworthy part of the opening is this shot with two Shikis. Of course, one of these is actually airy and I bet they're telling each other I'm me she says. Moving forward a bit, there's a shot with Kitaniji, Joshua, and Neku which represents all three major players in the game for Shibuya's fate. 
Once the intro is done and you arrive at Hachiko, Joshua can be seen standing there for a split second. As soon as the next scene plays, he's gone. Like Joshua says in the second week, he spent this week watching Neku. This detail is actually much easier to see in the DS game since the overworld is still visible even during cutscenes. But Joshua's sprite does blend in more with the crowd in this version, so maybe it all evens out. On the second day, you meet Beat and Rhyme. Beat introduces Rhyme as his partner, but takes a pause midway through his sentence because he's not used to not calling her his sister. Uh. You then soon gain access to your phone menu. There, you can swap out what song plays in that menu. You start out with only one, It's So Wonderful, which also is the title screen music. Its description reads, when you're ready to just reset everything. Because the only thing you can do on the main menu is start the game or reset it. Now's as good as time as any to mention this. Did you know that on the DS version, you can move your pins around by pausing in battle? Well, congrats, now you do. You can then come across this geek who's really obsessed with the Moai statue. And even though we never get to see his talking sprite, his overworld sprite shows that he is the character Pin Professor, who is based off of Tomohiro Hasegawa, the game's co-director. You can find him in a few places throughout the game, but most notably in another day. He's also able to be seen standing in front of the statue on the final day of the third week. We also get our first glimpse at Higashizawa this day. He has a yellow eye due to him only recently acquiring his noise form, Avis Cantus, and still not fully being able to control it. On the third day, we first meet Hanekoma and also hear his theme, Game Over. The entire song is one of the few World Unto Do songs that I feel like is meant to directly represent something in-universe, with its lyrics summing up Hanekoma's character. Specifically, it talks about an amenity within art to parallel Hanekoma's double life as the artist Cat, who in itself is likely a reference to Banksy. One of the lines in the songs compares an amenity to the Japanese text board 2 channel. Few lies of the sentence lie, anonymity annoying me all the time. It's like a two channel where people just throw their anger and forget about those foul actions. While we're on Mr. H, he drops some facts about himself. First off, his birthday is March 3rd. 3-3 is an angel number. He also admits to being a big gambler, which is evident when he goes on to place his bet on Sho to stop Joshua from destroying Shibuya by teaching him the secrets of taboo energy. Gotta say, not super sure that gamble worked out. The third day also takes you to the Shibuku main store for the first time. There's a sign that reads 10 slash 8, which could maybe suggest that this game takes place around October 8th. Or maybe not, I don't know. Apparently, the dates in this series don't even make sense if you try to put them together, so probably no point in thinking about it. By doing a side quest on this day, you can get the Lucky Star Pin, which, along with Tin Pin Rocker, is official Death March merchandise, which was brought to my attention by a tweet from at Out of Your Vector. One of the pins that you can get from this day's boss is the pin Righty Cat, part of the Over the Top set. I built a theory off of this in my Gods and Demons video, but this pin and the others in its set, Lefty Cat and Brainy Cat, have descriptions that tie them to power, wisdom, and courage, in a reference to the Triforce from The Legend of Zelda. When inside 10-4 on the next day, we can see Mina and Nao simping for the prince. This is the first appearance for both of these characters. Later in the scene, Shiki tells Neku that the way he dresses sends a message. In response, Neku thinks that he wishes he had more zippers so that he could tell her to zip it. This, of course, is a reference to the World Unto Thieves main character designer Tetsuya Nomura, who was and is very famous for excessively putting zippers on plenty of his designs. Heading into the Wild Boar shop afterwards will allow you to find the thread Sabotage and 3 MCs 1 DJ, which are both references to different Beastie Boy songs. As the day progresses, you'll soon unlock the Noise Report. This allows you to see all the noise enemy names, so I feel like now's a good time to mention that all of the noise are named after various genres of music. I'm not going to go over all 90-something references here, look them up yourself. Right after, you can enter the shop Mind and Body Foods and chat up its shopkeeper, Banzai Ayanakoji. After leveling up his FSG enough, he'll mention that he has a grandson named Shudo. That's the little tin pin snot who you can run into later in the game. At the end of the day, Ryan becomes shark food and saves Beat's unlife. But for just a moment, an image flashes of Beat trying to save Ryan from a car. This is an early foreshadowing to their death that entered them into the Reapers game. 
Ikaria then offhandedly mentions how to create noise as set up for the one thing that Beach will actually accomplish when he becomes a Reaper. But I want to draw attention to the fact that this is the one instance in the entire game script outside of the secret reports in which the concept of Soul with a capital S is brought up. And of course, it's from Karia. Afterwards, Neku has a brief moment where he says that Rhyme's death is just like that time before struggling to remember what time he's actually talking about because Amnesia will do that to you. This doesn't get brought up for the rest of the main story, but the moment in question is likely the death of Neku's old best friend, an event greater explored in another day and one that led him to become the little emo boy that he is at the start of the game. Not really anything to say about the fifth day unless you're playing final remix and head into AMX, in which there's a lot of music that you can buy with a lot of noteworthy details. The live version of 3 Minutes Clapping directly mentions its singer, JD Camaro, and I believe this is one of, if not the only CD in the series to do that. The track Runaway is also here and has a description that talks about ending since it acts as this version's credits theme. There's also a new version of Twister here called the Union Cross Mix, which was a song that you could play in the lobby of the mobile game Kingdom Hearts Union Cross when equipping one of the World Ends With You medals. Its description talks about going to new worlds, meeting up with your friends like agreed upon, and holding on to promises. All of these are concepts and themes common in the Kingdom Hearts series. On the next day, Shiki is particularly down in the dumps because the scary food man said some scary food words to her. She's so bummed out, in fact, that her dialogue when escaping a battle changes. Normally, when you run from a fight, she will slowly start chastising Neku more and more until she reaches her limit and starts clucking like a chicken. I guess that detail wasn't super important to this easter egg, but I didn't know when else I was going to tell you that this scene exists, so it's happening now. Anyway, on day 6, Shiki just doesn't say anything, prompting Neku to comment on how awkward the situation is. Throughout the rest of the day, Neku and Shiki follow my boy Makoto around as he tries to sell red skull pins to various NPCs, some of which haven't really been introduced yet like Shooter. Also, Yammer shows up early, say hi. But the most interesting group that he meets is Soda and Now, who become players in the second week, meaning that this has to be one of their final moments before dying. This is touched on more in the anime. This is also the first day that you can enter Tawa Records and, in Final Remix, obtain the 1960s version of Calling. Its description references Back to the Future by telling you to hop on a DeLorean for the song's futuristic and retro vibes. You can also find the Kingdom mix of Calling and Twister here in Final Remix, which both first debuted in Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance. Their descriptions both mention hearts as a reference to the hearts of which there is a kingdom. Twister's description also says that the song is thanks to the ultimate crossover. Hey, would you look at that? The first final day sees us battle Higashizawa's noise form, Avis Cantus. Higashizawa, along with all the other Reapers, have their noise forms determined from their names and whatever animal from the Chinese zodiac is hidden within them. I'll cover the rest as we progress through the story, but Higashizawa has the Japanese word for goat hidden in his name, which can also be translated to sheep or ram. Just take my word for it. Like I said, I'm not nearly bilingual enough to correctly explain the etymology. And while we're at it, his name also has the word for East hidden in it. Each of the game's four Game Masters have a direction hidden in them. As an example, the Game Master at the start of this week, Megumi Kitaniji, has the word North hidden in his name. Moving over to the second week, we meet Joshua. In the DS game, he refers to Neku by name a little bit before Neku actually introduces himself. You would think this is an intentional detail, but apparently not since he got removed from all future versions. That said, he is still very capable of referring to Neku by name early in battle. Have fun, Neku. Neku first meets the Mina Man soon after, and when Sho sees the two, he's shocked to see that Joshua is a player now. Neku mistakenly believes Sho to be talking about him. Additionally, Sho says that some old horses can always hear their owner approach. The first letters of each word are capitalized because they all spell out Sokotoa, a mnemonic expression used to remember trigonometric functions. 
Sho calling Joshua his owner shows that Sho knows that Joshua is the composer. A further detail from Sho and Josh's pre-game tussle is his megaphone, or more specifically, the hand that he's holding it with. Sho's dominant hand, as seen in Neku's later flashbacks, is his right one since he's holding his gun with it. This is the hand that doesn't have any tattoos. But Sho holds the megaphone with his other hand throughout the game, possibly due to getting shot in his dominant arm just before the story began. On the second day, Shooter gives Neku a drawing explaining how Tin Pin works. The drawing just so happens to include a little sketch of Ken Doi, the ramen man, who is the creator of Tin Pin in Another Day, and also possibly the creator in This Day, since I'm not sure why else he would be in this drawing. I don't know, maybe Shooter's like an angel that jumps between worlds or something. Matt Pat call me. The Tin Pin Slammer theme goes by a few names depending on your version of the game, but one of them is Slam Brothers, a reference to Nintendo's popular Super Smash Brothers series. With this and that upside down Smash Ball in A East, we can only wonder why Neku's not in yet. Sho then shows up like an organization member, spouts some stuff that the protagonist doesn't understand, and then leaves. But when he leaves, he says QED, class is dismissed. QED is short for the Latin phrase, Quad Eret Demonstrandum, which roughly translates to it has been demonstrated and is commonly placed at the end of a mathematical proof. The next day begins with Joshua faking a mission mail to get to Cat Street just so he could meet with Hanakoma. As Neku points out later, he never actually got the mission mail since Josh fabricated it all on his phone. But it's also notable that Joshua can't actually receive mission mail in the first place since he's not an official player. When Neku and his partner arrive at Cat Street, they have the ability to go into the Jupiter of the Monkey store, so I feel like now is a good time to cover this brand. It's Neku's favorite brand and the brand where all of his clothes are supposed to come from. Also, its name is similar to the name of one of the development studios, Jupiter. Also, its name is similar to a certain YouTube channel. While we're Jupiter of the Monkeying, let's go over the meanings behind its pin names. Huge apology up front, I'm gonna do my best, but I probably will butcher a good few of these names. Masumune is named after one of Japan's greatest swordsmiths, Goro Nayudu Masumune. It is also the name of Sephiroth's sword. Onikiri is named after the samurai Watanabe no Suna's sword. The World Ends of You wiki claims that Ninikiri is named after a blade used to kill the demon Nene, but I cannot find another source on that one. Kanasada is named after a well-known lineage of Japanese swordsmiths, and that's pretty much the same exact deal with Enju as well. Yoshimitsu could be named after a good few different swordsmiths or samurais. Ichimonji is named after a set of swords made for Emperor Gotoba. Nikari is named after the legendary sword Nikari Aoi. Mikazuki is named after a thousand year old sword made by Sanjo Munichika. Shiro is named after the Shiro Kunimitsu family of swordsmiths. Unjo is maybe the name of a swordsmith too, but I can only find a mention of them on page 341 of the Japanese Book of the Ancient Sword, never tell me that I'm not putting in the effort. Izanagi is named after one of the creator deities of Japanese mythology. Murasame is named after some cursed sword. Rakuyo is the Romaji pronunciation of the city of Loyang. Kusunagi is the name of Kusunagi no Suragi, one of the three imperial regalia of of Japan, Ohobari is named after Ame no Ohobari, a sword used by Izanagi to solve his family drama, and by that I mean murder his children. Zansetsu is derived from Zansetsuken, a nickname for blades made by Yasuhiro Kobayashi. Midama is named after a kind of Japanese spirit. Izanami is the name of Izanagi's wife. It is also the name of his sister. They're the same person. Anmyo is named after Anmyoto, which is a sort of Japanese yin and yang. And Konohana and Konohana Sakuya are named after Konohana Sakuya Hime, a Japanese goddess of Mount Fuji. As for the threads, the Watatsumi is likely named after Watatsumi, a Japanese water dragon. Fudo is likely named after Fudo Myu, the Japanese localization of Akala, a Buddhist deity. Akala was said to be the protector of the concept of order and virtue and stuff, which was called Dharma, which inspired the name of the Dharma item. Sutin is the Japanese name of Varuna, also Buddhist. Harumitsu is part of the Japanese Buddhist mantra, Shiken Harumitsu Daiko Mayo. Amida is named after Amida Butsu, the Japanese pronunciation of the Buddhist teacher Amitabha. Ashura is Japanese for a Buddhist demigod or titan. Brahma is named after a Buddhist god king, sort of guy thing. Kamukutin is named after Virupakasa, one of the Buddhist four heavenly kings. Togenko is likely named after Tosenkyo, a gorge in Japan. Inazuma just literally means lightning. Hanya is a sort of freaky mask thing from Japanese theater. Om is a Hindu symbol. Gekirin literally translates to 
Imperial Wrath. Karma is a popular concept that appears in both Buddhism and Hinduism, in which good or bad actions will lead to good or bad things happening to a person. And lastly, Naraka also appears in both Buddhist and Hindu belief systems and is a concept of hell. My concept of hell was spending over three hours researching all of that. When talking with Hanakoma, Mr. H tells Neku the Joshua backstory that may or may not even be true. But what is true is Neku's reaction to hearing that Joshua could see the Yuji from the RG. Like what? I see dead people kind of things? As a reference to the famous line from The Sixth Sense. I see dead on your way back, you'll have a mini-boss encounter with Beat. Beat, like most other Reapers in this game, has a name that has an animal from the Chinese Zodiac hidden in it, which would be used to determine his noise form. If he had one. In Beat's case, it's the monkey. The song playing during his fight in Final Remix is called Tatakai, and is one of the few songs in the series aside from Game Over from earlier that was seemingly written with the intent of tying into a character. The song's lyrics are very fitting for Beat's story. Later on in the day, you can find Shooter and Yammer discussing the Tin Pin Slammer TV show Slammerai. Yammer mentions two of its characters, Black and Yellow, and speculates that the two might actually be brothers. In Another Day, Black is the codename given to Rhyme, and Yellow is the codename given to Beat. More on Tin Pin, outside of Stride, you can see a Reaper who, in Another Day, is revealed to be the Wizard of Slam. More on him later, but I would also like to note that I would also guess this to be the unexplained Reaper on the final day of the third week that isn't quite so possessed by the Red Skull. Since you can go to Molko, you can meet the shopkeeper, Nana Majima, who runs the Tiger Punk shop. According to prolific community translator Zeta, her and her shop are reference to the manga series Nana. Her design is based off of the the character Nana K. She also sells the gold padlock necklace thread item, which is worn by the Nana character Ren. The item description even has an indirect mention of him, claiming that it was made in honor of that legendary punk rocker. At the start of the fourth day, Neku and Joshua play some tin pin, and Neku mocks Joshua by doing one of Josh's poses. This is the only time that this specific sprite is used in the entire game. They made it just for this bit, and I love that. After doing this whole microphone side quest that, spoilers, goes nowhere, BJ admits that he was at the phone booth to ask a girl out and got rejected. Thanks, sorry man. But if you want to invade my man's privacy and find out who his crush is on, just go and find Uzuki and Karia on the previous day. Because Uzuki will receive a call from BJ and quickly hang up because the poor guy didn't speak up enough. After finally getting past Death March, you can go to Shibuku Heads for the first time and by extension, the pharmacy where you can pick up some sink bars. A food item that's designed to make you friends without you even having to try. It's also hated by everyone, except Joshua because he's lonely. Aww. You can also meet Shigimori Iwata, the shopkeeper for the third floor. If you pay attention to certain thoughts and shopkeeper dialogue throughout the game, you'll learn that he's the brother of Yoji Iwata, the Tower Records shopkeep, and Shinta Iwata, the Cosmic Corner owner. Shinta is the oldest of the three. Also, also, one of the Q heads is named Tatsuya Amora. Take a wild guess as to who that could be referencing. This is also the first point in the game where the player can enter Udagawa and Psycho Records where you can pick up Twister, the game's main theme and a song often associated with Neku. Furthering that connection, its description reads, when you can't get past your boundaries, symbolizing Neku's inability to expand his world at the start of the game. Also, Twister Remix's description reads, when you've crossed every boundary. The Kingdom mix of Someday can also be found here in Final Remix. The song also first appeared in Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance. Its description talks about reaching for forgotten memories. I want to say that this is a reference to Chain of Memories, or possibly even Rhyme's weird unexplained memory loss from Dream Drop. Not a ton to say about the fifth day, except for this one Reaper review. The Reaper asks who runs Ramen Don, and the correct answer is Ken Doi, but one of the wrong answers is Tatsuya Kondo. In a way, this is sort of the correct answer, since Kondo is the game's director and Ken Doi was based off of him. Throughout Shibuya, there are also a handful full of images that depict Kondo slash Kendoi. My favorite is this one right here in the Scramble Crossing, which just straight up is a photo of Tatsuya Kondo. On the final day of the second week, Neku and Joshua make their way to Pork City, and it has the gimmick where each floor blocks each brand's pin except for one. This is hinted at earlier when the players get the message, have cow and mouse on hand. 
As Joshua points out, if you stand still and talk to him, this relates to the brands D plus B and Mus Radis, which represents the cow and mouse in the Chinese Zodiac. All of the brands in the series are tied to one of the animals on the Chinese Zodiac or an animal associated with the Zodiac. There's a lot of Zodiac symbolism not just in the brands, but in a lot of other places in the game, like with the Reaper's names. I'll keep touching on them as they come up, but we can go more in depth another day. By this point, you should have been able to acquire Joshua's third tier fusion. Normally, fusions operate off of a damage multiplier. Cheeky and Beats level 3 uses a times 20 multiplier, but Joshua's uses a times 99. 9.9 multiplier and is apparently so busted that it can overflow the game and wind up healing enemies. That info is sourced from at Spookiwi and at Daily Josh Neku. The week ends with a battle against Tamina Mimoto. His health in the noise report is 3141. 3.141 are the first four digits of pi. Man is literally made of math. Oh, also say hi to his noise form, Leo Cantus. It's based off of a lion because Sho has the word for the pig zodiac hidden in his name. Wait, that's not right. Apparently, the kanji for pig is phonetically similar to the kanji for lion, and that's why he's a lion. Also, someone wrote on the World Ends With You wiki that while lions aren't a part of the Chinese zodiac, they are a part of the western one, which suggests that Sho's rebellion extends to him being a part of a totally different zodiac. I don't know if that's true or intended at all, but it's still really funny. Also, the place he's hiding out on this day is Pork City, repping the pig in his name. Oh, and since he's a game master, he also has the word for a compass direction in his name. This time, it's south. In Final Remix, the song Transformation plays for Sho's fight and is generally accepted as Sho's theme. As far as I can tell, there isn't a ton in the song's lyrics that explicitly states it to be Sho's theme, but the title Transformation shares its name with a geometric concept. When you beat Sho, he decides to suicide bomb Neku and Joshua instead of simply getting erased because Sho's a petty one. Specifically, he does it with an attack called a Level Eye Flare, which is an attack with a ton of layers and meanings and probably like three extra ones that only Dog Emperor knows. Let me try and break this one down best as I understand it. A flare attack is lifted from the Final Fantasy series and are generally like large magic blasts of some variety intended to wipe out whole waves of enemies. Final Fantasies 5 through 7 all had what were called the level flare attacks. These only dealt damage to targets who had levels equal to a multiple of the flare level. So if you bust out a level 4 flare, you'll hit enemies that are level 16 but not level 17. I is an imaginary number and is the equivalent to the square root of negative 1. Long math short, every number is a multiple of I regardless of whether or not the number is even real. Therefore, the level I flare will hit anything and everything. Oh, and it's also probably getting some sort of boost from the fact that imagination is an actual tangible force that's used to power the Sykes in the World Ends With You universe. So when everyone expects Joshua to be dead, that's because he should have been ultra toast from this attack. If you're playing New Game Plus, then you can find the boy's uniform with blazer item on this day. Its description says that it's from St. Michael's School. It is named after Michael, one of the archangels, and if I know my world ends with you, then I bet there's probably some secret lore there. Similarly, on the first day of the third week, you can nab the girl's uniform with blazer on New Game Plus, which is said to be from St. Ursula's. St. Ursula is a Christian martyr. Another one of the St. Ursula uniforms can also be found in another day. Konishi is our final game master, so let's cover a little bit about her. Throughout the game, Konishi's dialogue has always been in a square text box instead of the rounded bubble most other characters use. This seems to show an extremely formal tone that she always speaks with. The first day of the third week is the first time that she drops that and it's when she's alone. The most notable time that she drops it later is when she's being erased. On the third day of the third week, you have the ability to unlock a book called Black Cat Atlas Volume 10. The book reads, playing Reaper Creeper requires Matoya's spell, but then there's what looks like to be gibberish. I said gibber- I just say gibber it? Oh my gosh. Gibberish.
is a mouthful so most people don't bother. Latoya is a character from Final Fantasy who owns these brooms that tell you how to access the world's map but speak the instructions backwards. The gibberish on the Black Cat Atlas describes how you see your playtime. The text is different depending on your version since DS and Final Remix have different methods of doing that. Why on earth seeing your playtime is an easter egg is beyond me. If you go into the stride on this day to play some Tin Pin, you'll find the Pin Professor from before and Ken Doi playing some Tin Pin. But they're joined by a new face. He gets named in another day as the Vice Wizard of Slam and is based off of the planning director Takashi Arakawa. It's worth noting that most players assume him to be based off of Tetsuya Nomura because I won't lie, they do look pretty similar. But no, this is Arakawa, not Nomura. The day ends with a battle against Izuki. Just like Beat, she does not have a noise form but still carries the naming conventions as if she did. She has the word for the rabbit zodiac hidden in her name. So if she ever graduates and loses those wings, she'll turn into a rabbit noise. And before all of Shibuya starts writing the countless wrongs of their days, at Zeta Troll found a thought fragment in the game from a person who has spotted Reapers going to and from the Yuji before. Even citing this happening in Utagawa in particular, so there's a chance that they witnessed either Joshua or Sho coming or going on their way to bully Neku. The fourth day begins with Neku and Beach being dumped onto the Miyashita Park underpass. There, the two find a little memorial for Beat and Rhyme's death. Part of the memorial is a can of cola and a glass of milk. Cola is one of Beat's favorite drinks, so milk might be one of Rhyme's. Swear, just saying that if you ever make Rhyme playable, please let her like milk. Thank you. This day ends with Neku and Beat fighting Karia. Just like Uzuki, he can't turn into a noise, but sure does have a zodiac in his name. That being the dog. Karia's noise form would be a puppy. Oh, and then you fight both Uzuki and Karia at the same time. In the DS version, they use a light puck just like you and your partner, allowing them to take advantage of all the perks that the player gets by controlling two characters. This was not carried over into Final Remix. I shudder to think of the version of this fight in which these two use cross combos to combo lock you. On day 5, you can get the head honcho uniform, which is a reference apparently to the Japanese Nintendo DS game Osu Tatake Oidan, which is a game that I've known about since 5 minutes before writing this part of the script. The clothing item is one that you collect in New Game Plus, and just like all of the other New Game Plus items, there's a corresponding person thinking about it in the game. And the title of their thought is which is something that they say in the game, I think. Dang, is this what normal people feel like if they ever talk about the world ends with you? Neku and Beach run back in the show and have a fight with him. This time his health is 5,926, which are the next four digits of Pi after the first four were used in his first battle. After losing to him, Beat asks what sort of things this tank of a man eats. In response, Sho says that he eats slabs of ham, celery, and horseradish, tons of asparagus. Just like when Sho first met Joshua, the first letters are all capitalized and they all again spell out Sokotoa. Final day! We fight Konishi's noise form, Tigris Cantus, and you know the drill. Her name contains the word for the Tiger Zodiac. Her outfit is also black and white like a tiger. Also, she has the final direction, West, in her name. As you progress through this final stretch, you'll come across the Trail of the Judged, which is full of Cat's artwork. Cat's artwork has a ton of symbolism, but most of it is a little interpretive. What I do want to point out is that each of the symbols for the Darklit Planet pins are hidden in his artwork both here and in the Miyashita Park underpass. Here in the Trail of the Judge, you'll find Black Mars, Black Mercury, and Black Jupiter. Over in Miyashita, you can see Black Uranus and Black Saturn with Black Venus additionally being visible in the DS version. The art for the Eden set is also visible here. Not long after, Neku arrives in the Room of Reckoning. The background depicts two pillars with a Reaper and an angel on each one, with the composer's throne in between each. This symbolizes how the composer is the intermediary between the two. Or it would if that didn't get reckoned. We soon find out Kitaniji's grand plan. He wants to unite all of Shibuya under one voice so that other people's desires and thoughts are silenced. This is a dark exaggeration of Neku's beliefs at the start of the game, and to hammer that home, both characters wear headphones. Both wish to hear no evil. We also soon see Kitaniji's noise form, Anguis Cantus. It's a big snake. 
Kitanishi's name has the word for the snake zodiac hidden in it. One of the pins able to be dropped by it is the hip snake pin because it's a big snake. Also, his headphones are purchasable at Tower Records, which is an area that Hip Snake commonly defaults to as the most popular brand. Kitaniji gives his final boss just one extra phase by merging with Joshua and creating Draco Cantus. Since Joshua is secretly the composer, he follows the naming conventions of most Reapers. He has the Japanese word for dragon, I actually know this one, Ryu hidden in his name. And Draco Cantus is a dragon. Also, most of his abilities and threads come from the dragon-themed brand, Dragon Couture. To finish out the main story, when Neku does his super ultra mega blast of pure unfiltered protagonist energy, for a second you can see the Reaper symbol in the attack. No, not there. There. Another day begins and the first person Neku can see is Shiki, who looks just like she does in the RG. If you choose to immediately book it to Utagawa, you can find Joshua, who will completely unpromptedly explain that our perception of reality has preconditioned us to only show Shiki like Eri. Oh, and P.S. Making a new sprites for her just for this day would have been a waste of dev time. Thank you, Joshua. Very cool. More on Shiki, an item related to her now appears in one of the shops. At Lapin Parka says that if you obtain the Her Stuffed Animal item in New Game Plus, which is just Mr. Mew, the item description clarifies that Shiki uses Psychomancy to control the doll and not Psychokinesis. Psychomancy, according to Dictionary.com, is the occult communication between souls or spirits. Feel free to make your own conclusions there. Another day houses the game's secret boss, Hanakoma's noise form, Panthera Cantus. Hanakoma has the word for cat, Neko, hidden in his name. Also, Neku does, but this isn't about him. The cat actually isn't a part of the Chinese Zodiac, but did try to join. His relationship to the cat is also further embodied with his alias cat, his affinity for drawing cats, and his cafe Wildcat on Cat Street, where you can get abilities for threads that he supplied to the Gatito brand, which is Spanish for cat. I just love how this game couldn't spell subtlety if it tried. When Neku's done getting his butt kicked and finally reaches Molko, he's greeted by the scary food man pretending to be a booth babe. He says the line, Dilly Dally Shilly Shally, a reference to Tifa in Final Fantasy VII Advent Children. Dilly Dally Shilly Shally. Later on, Shiki is given the code name Green, which is said to match her skirt, but also matches the main color scheme of her real appearance. As you progress through the day, you'll be able to obtain the pins Tinpin Bahamut, Tinpin Ifrit, and Tinpin Shiva. All of these are references to summons from Final Fantasy. Hey, remember that techie that was helping out Triple Seven and who appeared throughout the game? Well, turns out he has a name and it's only ever said in another day. It's Futoshi. There you go. If you go and decide to beat Kitaniji in a game of Tinpin, he will say, I now see why he picked you. Look. Just like he does when he gets a race in the main story. Why Funimation didn't hire me to voice Kitanishi in the English dub, I will never know. You're able to find Soda around this point, and if you do, he'll reveal that he's Neku's barber. Aside from the fun revelation that Neku has his hair modeled after comic book characters, Soda also mentions that Neku is in need of a haircut. This is because, according to one of the guidebooks, Neku keeps his hair long in the main story to allow him to hide his face. But since Neku isn't cursed with as much emo-ness in another day, the reason for his hair length is that he He's just been putting off a haircut. Alright, this next one is less easter egg and more just plain hidden detail, but I like it, so we'll quickly cover it. If you decide to go into Wildcat before bringing Ryan back through the Miyashita Park underpass, you'll trigger a scene where Hanakoma explains to Neku that he's out looking for some reports he's written, and if Neku wants to lend him a hand, he should grab any that he sees, as long as he never, ever reads them. Of course, Hanakoma is talking about the secret reports that the player spends most of the post-game collecting. The day's true final boss is this man who calls himself the Wizard of Slam. But Joshua also names him Shinji Hashimoto. As is stated fairly plainly, he is the producer. Not just of Tinpin, but the world ends of view as well. 
Ah, 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 we're not done yet because Final Remix has a new day which has its own batch of Easter eggs and a new Reaper, Koko Adarashi. Her name in Japanese literally translates to new girl because the writers just think they're hilarious. But she also has a word for the rat zodiac kitten in her name so her noise form would be a rat or more likely a mouse since she has mouse ears on her jacket. If you decide to start reading people's minds at any point in a new day, you might come across one titled Descriptive. It talks about the kanji for the word new, which would later be a part of the title of the next game. Neo meaning new, and the kanji that this guy is talking about is even on the logo. I should be clear, however, that one of Neo's developers has stated that the name was come up with very shortly before the game's announcement two years after Final Remix. So whether or not this reference was real foreshadowing is up to you. To progress in this day, you will be required to nab the green dragon pin. This along with the other new pins in this day have their designs lifted from Live Remix, which is a game that I'm not explaining in this video. But Green Dragon has the fun distinction of still carrying the logo for the brand that it originated from in Live Remix, even if it's unbranded here in Final Remix. Right there, you can see the logo for Mithril Scale. And I guess while we're on the subject, the pin Unfortune Teller is a reference to Alice in Wonderland. The final boss of a new day is a taper, which is believed in Japanese folklore to consume nightmares, which might tie into its role here as a being made of dissonance energy. But that's not all. At Dusk Neko says that in Solo Remix, Coco's secret reaper shop is found in the bottom left corner of the scramble, right here. I don't have footage of it because it's still not worth $18. In A New Day, this is the same location that you can find the boss noise version of Dissonance Taper. Is there a connection there? Almost certainly not, but you and I both know that I love to overthink Coco. After clearing the day, you'll be able to go back to Wildcat and grab the final boss theme. Question mark, question mark, question mark. Its description reads when time travel is on your mind, hinting at Rindo's replay ability from the next game. Oh, also, the original release of the DS game manual had a reference to Meat Spin. Cutting ahead 14 years later, now it's time to dig up every reference and hidden goodie in the game's anime adaptation, The World Unto View, the animation. So, of course, spoilers for the anime and its source material. Once again, still no spoilers for the second game. If you're one of those people that the legend spoke of who's only seen the anime and hasn't played the game, don't worry. I'll explain most of the references to the game in extra detail. That said, I won't be covering any easter eggs that were carried over from the game. So things like the meanings behind character designs or noise form names won't be covered here since I did that in the first video. Give it a watch if you're curious. Once again, we'll be taking a look at the English version, as in the one that Funimation made where they speak English words out loud with their mouths. This version has extra easter eggs added in referencing the English release of the game specifically. I'm sure it's the same in Japanese and if I ever suddenly wake up with the the ability to speak the language, I'll make a video on that one. But until then, y'all are free to leave a comment if you think that version of the show has any unique details that I'm missing out here. With that out of the way, let's begin the animation. <laughs> Episode 1's gonna be a doozy, and by that I mean we're gonna be talking about it for a while. This episode is called The Reaper's Game, which is also the name of the game's first chapter. The show begins with Neku waking up in the scramble just like the game. But as he does, we see a number of familiar faces from later in the show go by. Futoshi, Ai, Mina, Soda, and now all walk by Neku with Makoto joining them later. Yes, I'm saying Makoto instead of Makoto Funimation, try and stop me. Just like in the game, there are 13 brands that people care about in this town. Right here are the start, Tiger Punks, Lapin Angelique, Pegaso, Jupiter the Monkey, Musratus, Pavo Real, Gatito, and Hip Snake are all popular in the scramble, with the rest also appearing throughout the show. The scene then shows Neku get run over by a truck only for it to go straight through him. This is a recreation of an unused beta scene from the original DS game, and it's really cool that the scene was finally able to be included in the series. When Neku receives his mission mail, he receives it on a smartphone. That's because the animation takes place a little further into the future than the game. Just like the game, the exact date is kinda pointless to try and get and wouldn't fully make sense anyway. Like, there's no way that Neku has a smartphone but also an MP3 player from 2006, right? 
Surely I won't eat these words later and try to figure out the date down to the month anyway. Pointless detail, but Neku's timer totally starts at 59 minutes and 30 seconds instead of the full 60 minutes. I'm telling you, this game is rigged in more ways than usual this time. Then a certain easter egg from the game is carried over. For a second, you can see Joshua chilling in the background right over there. Joshua just can't resist more screen time. Soon after, we get to meet Shiki and fun fact. Shiki is voiced by Morgan Garrett in this show. That is, not an easter egg in the slightest, but while scripting this video, I was also watching Nichi Joe, in which she voices Yuko, and I cannot unhear this now. Please send help. Hey, you okay? I get it. You're mad at me, and I think I understand why. Why is that? Yesterday I stole a bite of broccoli from your lunch, the last piece, and now you're angry. Well, that makes zero sense to me. Anyway, the song playing over Neku and Shiki's first interaction is It's So Wonderful, which is the title screen song for the game. The two soon initiate their first fight against an army of Dixie Frogs, just like in the game. In this show, Neku just sort of has the ability to conjure up his psychs, unlike the game where you had to collect and select spins to build his moveset. Well, there is one line where Shiki says that Neku does have some other unseen pins on his person, but you know, out of sight, out of mind. You've got most of the pens. What do I have that you don't? When Neku does activate a psych, the symbol for its corresponding pin does briefly appear. For this first fight, Neku starts with Pyrokinesis before bringing out Shockwave, which has been changed from a hand slash to a kick. Afterwards, he uses Murasame, which has been changed from an uppercut to a psych that allows him to jump real good. And just so I'm not stopping like a dozen times in this video to point them all out as they come up, here are most of the show's pins and psychs. Episode 1 has Thunderbolt, Episode 2 has Red Skull, Lightning Moon, and Fiery Spirit, Spirited Fire. Episode 3 has What's Up Thunder, Ice Blow, Sweet Talk Tether, and Flame Safar, Foes of Flame. Episode 4 has Pop Pendulum. Episode 6 has Frozen Cool, Swift Storm, Swift End and Crackle Pop Barrier. Episode 8 has Swing Bishop. Episode 9 has Blast Warning and What's Up Voltage. Episode 10 has Thunder Rook and Blizzard Cool. Episode 11 has Carson, Rhyme, and Creepy Weepy Barrier. And Episode 12 has Final Fusion. Back to our first fight, the song playing over it is Calling, a popular song from the game's soundtrack. As the fight goes on, the graffiti in the environment displays the show's credits. This is because this sequence replaces the actual opening for this episode. In fact, back Back when the show was planned to use Teenage City Riot by Ali for the intro theme, that's the song that was supposed to play here. Since we're now in a version of Shibuya at least a decade later than the original game's depiction, there are a few noticeable changes to the city. For one, this train car near the statue of Hachiko was added because it was placed there in the time since the game. Furthermore, the 10-4 building has been altered to use a more updated logo. Except for the version and the 7 days bargain, but I'm not gonna spend 10 minutes overthinking it this time, I swear. I'm not going to go over every element of the city that looks like real life, since most of it resembles real life. It is worth noting though that places like Q Floor have been renamed to Q Front, since that's what they're called IRL. For the anime, the team chose to actually get the rights to use the official names for most locations. 10-4 is still 104 instead of 109, not because they didn't get the rights, but because 10-4 is just too iconic to the world ends with you. In this show, Karya is voiced by Andrew Kishino, which I point out since he's the only person in the English cast to actually reprise their role from the game. The Japanese version was much better fed in this regard. I believe Hanakoma's voice actor was the only one out of the main cast to not come back. Neku and Shiki soon arrive at 10-4 and a little logo for the district briefly appears on screen. Just like what would happen every time you enter a new location in the game. The logo is even the same, just with more color. The same can be said for every time that they show a district logo in the show. Look, you can see them all right now on your screen. The mission mail for the second day comes through Beat's black and green cased phone. I find this interesting as Beat uses a red phone in the game and every other character's phone in the anime does match the color that they originally had. Okay, well, except Izuki, but shush. The mission for this day is to take out some garage wolves. This battle, and one later, shows us Rhyme's psych for the first time, since it wasn't ever seen in the game. She shoots green lasers that can stun enemies. Please, Neko! Uh, I... I have to. Oh hey, isn't that something? Time for a lore dump! 
The original game had these orange noise called negative noise that were drawn to any negative energy coming from an RG person. They are back in this show but are red just like your normal chump noise. Though he doesn't say their names directly, Joshua points out later that there still is a difference between the two. Well, generally speaking, there are two types of noise. So, there are strays that emerge as a natural product of the negative emotions real ground people give off. Then there's a second kind created by Reapers to erase players in the game. Also unlike the game, negative noise now possess people in the UG as well as the RG. That's why we see them get drawn to and possess Neku as he clears the second mission, which definitely doesn't happen in the game. Just to be clear, this video isn't everything that they changed in the animation. I'm not bringing up this difference for the sake of pointing out the difference. I bring this one up since the idea of noise possessing people in the UG is actually brought up as a theoretical concept in the game's secret reports. A collection of lore-filled documents written by Hanakoma. Neku awakes on the third day and we see Shooter and Yammer momentarily walk by. These two are minor characters from the first game. They're both even in the stances from their in-game sprites. I guess that's how they walk around everywhere? Neku then startles Shiki and she goes in into this stance, which is a recreation of one of her sprites from the game. I really love how the show integrates these from time to time and how they're all done organically. Let's go over them all real quick here. Kitaniji often puts his hand to his face like in the game. Minamimoto does two of his signature poses in his formal introduction. Neku does what kinda looks like his sad, introspective look when talking about Shiki in week 2. Beat also does what kinda looks like his sad look soon after. Episode 8 has Konishi doing her thinking pose and Beat doing his boah pose. And lastly, Beat does his thinking pose at the start of episode 10. The next new noise we meet is a Mosh Grizzly. As Neku and Shiki attack it in unison, they begin to glow. This is called a cross combo and is the combat system that the single screened versions of the original game used. Each hit raised a sync meter which Shiki references in her next line. <laughs> wow, you and I totally brought the heat just now. Like the two of us were perfectly synced up. Futosa returns from the game as a Reaper now, which, while not the biggest change the anime made, is by far the most strange. His outfit is also slightly altered to add the pattern that generic Harrier Reapers wear. There was a lot of thought put into this guy for reasons no mortal will ever know. Thankfully, though, I am not mortal. So, it's a conspiracy, right? And it all goes back to Kondo. Kondo doesn't want you to know this, but it- Uh-oh. What are you- Get out of here! But 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 your window was open, and I just—it's broken. Uh, uh. Out. Right. Where were we? Afterwards, we meet Triple Seven, head of the Death March band. Yeah, you heard that right. Death March, not Death March. I imagine the reason for this change is to pay homage to the band that the series composer, Takaharu Ishimoto, made a few years prior called Death March, which in itself was named after Death March. If that's already confusing you, don't worry. Somehow it gets even worse in Neo. As a reward for doing the Futoshi side quest, Triple Seven gives Shiki a level 2 key pin, claiming it to be merged from the concert. A similar event does happen in the game, although it requires Neku and Shiki to do something totally different and gets them real Death March merch as a reward. The other key pin levels can also be spotted throughout the show. Beat uses the level 1 key pin in episode 8 to punch down a wall. Karya gives Neku and Beat the level 4 key pin in episode 9. And Hanakoma hides the level 5 key pin for Neku to find in episode 10. The level 3 key pin is also used by Triple Seven to open a wall in episode 5 and then given to Neku and Beat in episode 8. In the game, this key pin was red, but for the show, it was redesigned to orange. The final fight for the first episode is against an army of bats, specifically Gabba Bats and Vespertilio Canner. When the bat is erased, it dissolves into static and the camera zooms into it, creating an effect similar to when defeating a boss in the game. Most bosses in the anime recreate this same effect. Finally, we're on to episode 2. The episode opens with a glimpse at Neku's lock screen, which shows that his wallpaper is an art piece by Cat, which is interesting as Neku probably has no clue why he picked that wallpaper. And we finally get to see the show's intro. We're gonna spend a minute here. The song playing is Twister, the main theme from the game. That said, for reasons only Joshua knows, the song Centimeter from Rent-A-Girlfriend actually fits better than Twister. I'm not playing it here, try it yourself. 
The opening opens with an overhead shot of Shibuya styled in monochrome. This was an aesthetic often used by the game's promotional art, but was also how the imaginary number plane looked in the game, which was a special battle arena for Pork slash Mark City fights. The plane is mentioned later on episode 7 by Joshua just like in the game, but it doesn't look any different than the Yuji. The opening then introduces us to our four main characters and rhyme. Neku's introduction has him taking a photo of the cat mural, which is a photo taken moments before disaster. Just before it transitions away, he even looks to the left, which is the direction that Joshua comes in from. Beat's introductory shot is Spain Hill. There you can see the Mexican dog shop and I and Mina, whose one important scene in both the anime and the game is in this location. Shiki Spotlight has her look into a hip snake store, which is all taped up with cat branded tape. Okay. Interestingly, there isn't actually a hip snake shop in the game. All of its items are sold through other stores. And yes, I checked. None of these items are actual thread items from the game unless those jeans are like youth smart or something. Anyway, this shot represents Shiki's fascination with fashion. But the surface is also reflective, meaning for a brief moment there are two Shikis on screen. Just like happens later in the story and just like the game's opening. Behind Joshua's spotlight, Soda and Nao can be seen since they are players during his week. Neku runs down what looks like the Miyashita Park underpass and fights off some bats and spiders. The spiders are noise that were not actually in the game at all. There was a scrapped spider boss, but these aren't that. Luckily, the art book was able to give us the official names for these little guys. All noise enemies from the game are named after genres of music, so the spiders are called... Spider. Dang, that's underwhelming. Also, one of the grindcore minks shows up for a few frames and Neku freaking one-shots it! That thing is a mini-boss, what?! Well, this specific coloring of mink appears a ton on the show, so I guess they chose their basic mink type to be this one for some reason. For the last few frames afterward, posters for Triple Seven's concert can be seen. And then Neku runs past some dub rhinos. Mr. Mew soon solos some noise, allowing us our first look at the Hardcore Hog and Jungle Boomer. The Swing Shark and Carcina Folk also soon show up as well. Then we get to see fish noise for the first time. Just like the spiders, they weren't in the game, and also just like the spiders, they were creatively named Fish. As can be seen later, they use the noise symbol for frogs, for some reason. Mr. H's reflection can be seen on the player pins when it comes up since he's their creator. The shot transitions over to the dead gods pad with this nifty fish cut. These fish are the fish that swim around underneath the pad's glass floor. And for our final shot, we get another aerial view of the city. This time with angel feathers falling down from the sky to represent the angels watching over the events of the story from the higher plane. If that sentence didn't make any sense, then that might be because it's info from the secret reports, which the anime doesn't really cover in a ton of detail. Now back to the actual episode itself. We see a memory that Neku has no right having of him at the cat art. Similarly to the game, cat's art throughout the show contains the art for the Eden set and a couple of the darklit planet pins. Specifically, Black Jupiter, Black Mercury, and Black Mars. Just like in the game, Shiki points out how rare Rhyme's pendant is, which was given her by Beat. But here it's clarified that the pendant was a birthday present. When talking about her brother, the camera camera frames itself on beat. Later, Shiki goes to Oogle at the D plus B store inside of 10-4, which is in the same location that it is in the game. And this time, the clothes on display are threads from the game. They're the Angelic One Piece and the Vest Blast combo, although only the Vest Blast combo is actually from D plus B. The One Piece is a natural puppy item. We also get a wider shot of the window and can see D plus B's plaid miniskirt paired with Jupiter the Monkeys, Haramitsu, and Amida. This isn't the only time that this happens either. Episode 3 has a Sheep Heavenly store with the Sheep Heavenly polka dot bag on display. The shop is even in the same location as the game. And Episode 9 has Hip Snake's Tree Leaf Serenade and Spring Breeze Rhapsody items on display in their store. A cool thing that the English version of the anime added was an integration of characters' battle quotes from the game into their fights here. Here's a quick montage of them. Why don't you back off? Why don't you back off? Watch yourself! Watch yourself! Ready to die? Then die! Ready to die! Die! You're good as God! You're good as God! Focus. Open up your senses. Focus. Open up to your senses. Follow my lead on this one. Screw that! Follow my lead! Screw that! Predictable. Predictable. How's my aim? How's my aim? 
Another world awaits. And you're going. Another world awaits. You're going. Come back when you grow a pair. Come back when you grow a pair. The beat is on. Let's bring it. The beat is on. Bring it. Go. Pick it up. I'm there. Pick it up, bro. I'm there. Shred this. Shred this. Let's start it up. No. Let's end it. Let's start it up. No. Let's end it. Sine. Cosine. Tangent. Sine. Cosine. Vexatious worm. Vexatious worm. Go, Mr. Mew! Get him, Piggy! Go, Mr. Mew! Get him, Piggy! Sora, look, it's a lucky emblem. Just like in the game, Soda and Nao make an early appearance during the next mission. But I want to point it out because unlike the game, their relationship is finally clarified to be romantic. Then this happens? Uh, this is one of those anime original scenes. In this one, Kitaniji totally tries to speedrun his game with Joshua and ended half a month early. We know this is Kitaniji because that's his noise symbol right there. Anyway, Joshua wasn't having any of that. Following Shiki having a Shiki moment, we finally get the real credit sequence. Just like the show itself, it uses a lot of similar poses and imagery from the game. Rhyme's there doing her sad pose, Show in the Trash Heap is a recreation of this arch, Neku's level 1 fusion pose, Shiki's level 1 fusion pose, Beat's attacking pose, Joshua's level Level 1 fusion pose, Hanakoma's, uh, I don't know what you'd call this one. He does that. We get a shot of the full main cast with the sun rising over them. Though Joshua is always Captain Shadow while also looking at the rest to foreshadow the ending where he's unable to really join them and can only onlook. Well, the game's ending anyway, this doesn't really happen in the anime. Our last shot shows us the good guys versus the bad guys. There really isn't a correlation between who's looking at who, but Neku being parallel with Kitaniji and Joshua being parallel with Sho is probably intentional. Especially the second since Joshua and Sho are shown to be parallel in Final Remix's promo art and the 15th anniversary piece. Now for episode 3, which is called Erased. Erased is the name of the game's fourth chapter, which is one of the ones that this episode adapts. At the start of the episode, Soda and Nao get stuck in a car accident. I find it noteworthy that the car that killed them looks a lot like the one this guy was driving in episode 1 and the one that kills Beat and Rhyme. Coincidence, or is Karasama here the real villain of the story? You tell me. Beats gets startled by the mission mail and Ryan comments on how funny his reaction is. It's not a perfect match, but one of the frames of his freakout are similar to one of his shocked sprites. Additionally, Rhyme's comment may be a reference to Another Day, where characters frequently mention how Beat looks like a comic book character when surprised. Rhyme is famously erased here, and the scene plays out shot for shot just like the game. Soul is also name-dropped here just like in the game, and I'd like to shout out Funimation subtitles for remembering to capitalize it. Okay, this next one's also in the game, and the anime just uses the same line verbatim, but I'm mentioning it now since I only noticed it when re-watching the third episode. Karia says... We worked hard this week on the seventh day we rest. In a reference to the book of Genesis, where God rested on the seventh day after spending the previous six days setting up the server. I might be reaching with this next one, but the hot dogs served to the two look fairly similar to the sprite from the game. But also, you know, they're hot dogs. I'd be more shocked if they looked wildly different. In the following fight against Higashizawa, Mr. Mew saves Neku from hitting the pavement and he thinks it's by calling it Piggy. This is a reference to the game where there's a running joke that Neku thinks Mr. Mew looks like a pig. I guess in this timeline, Shiki never corrects him, so he just lives life forever thinking that Mr. Mew isn't a cat. Also, when Mr. Mew enlarges, it's similar to how he becomes giant for Neku and Shiki's third tier fusion. Both of these also get called back in the last episode. When we see Higashizawa go stale and become erased, there's there's an interesting animation detail. When a noise or noise form disappears, it dissolves into static. When a player is erased, they dissolve into balls of light. But when a reaper like the scary food man here goes, they dissolve into both. On to the fourth episode and the second week. This episode is called Reapers, just like the ninth chapter of the game. One of the players who enters the game this week is wearing a Musratus hoodie, which was not in their catalog in the game. When fighting the dub rhinos, Neku uses the psych for the burning melon pin. Interestingly, this is the only pin from the show that's not documented on the anime's website. He isn't able to use it to defeat the dub rhinos, however, since just 
just like the game, they only take damage from behind. To end the battle, Neku and Joshua perform their level 2 fusion from the game. In the game, fusions have Neku and his partner do a large attack together, but in the anime, they usually consist of the two charging up stronger versions of their own individual psychs. The main exception is Joshua's fusions, which work just like how they do in the game, and Neku states that he's confused as to why he's suddenly more powerful when syncing up with Joshua. Of course, it's because Joshua is the composer. The only other exception to this is Neku and Beach's third tier fusion. Next up, we have not an easter egg, but this line got added to the English version of the anime, and it's gone underappreciated for far too long. Why so grim? Someone die? Haha, uh -huh, you're hilarious. Joshua takes Neku on an ice cream date, which I point out solely for the fact that Joshua doesn't like ice cream. Well, at least none of the ones they sell in game, neither of which seem to be for sale here. But we do get some shots of a different ice cream store, which is selling the crepe and soft serve swirl. The Pegasus store in the next shot surprisingly doesn't use in-game thread items for its clothes, but it is in the same spot as the game. When going to Parco, Neku and Joshua get into an encounter with some Eurobeat boomers just like in the game. They're only able to win the fight with a fusion since just like in the single screen versions of the game, attacking individually doesn't deal full damage. Oh hey look, a calendar! Oh no, a calendar! Calendars are like a cheat sheet for finding out the date, so let's work this one out. If I had to make a deduction, I'd say that this calendar represents August 2018. It's a recent enough month where the anime could plausibly take place, and the first day of it is a Wednesday, with its final day being a Friday. Also, it's in the summer. I'm no Japanese cultural expert, and if you are, you're more than welcome to comment and correct me, but I'm pretty sure that short sleeves on the school uniforms means that it can't be January. But like I said, timelining this series is futile. For example, if this really was 2018, the 10-4 logo should really look like this. But whatever, I promised that I wasn't getting trapped in this rabbit hole, so I'm sticking to that. We're moving on. Neku has some flashbacks to his time in the RG, so I'll take now to point out how the animators chose to represent the separation of the planes. From the RG, everything is in full color, but from the UG, only its residents are. The people in the RG appear more muted from the UG. Oh, and since according to the secret reports, noise are from the noise plane, they are in another art style, 3D. I remember when I first watched the show, I was really hoping that when Joshua's true form got revealed, they could keep the trend and have him be like in live action. Would it have looked awful? Yes, but counterpoint, it would have been funny. One punch later and we're at episode 5, and here I want to point out a weird inconsistency in the script for its start. Neku states, It's a new day, but... Which is incorrect. They didn't adapt that one, silly Neku. Joshua gives Neku with the fake mission mail to go to Cat Street just like in the game, and this time we can actually see him write it. When going into Wildcat, Joshua gives Neku a quick rundown of the menu and recommends the house blend, coffee, and pancakes items. He also mentions that donuts aren't bad either, which of the four mentioned is Joshua's least favorite in the game. Also, just like in the game, there's a poster inside that I believe is supposed to be of Ken Doi, or at least a reference to Tatsuya Kondo who he was based on. As far as I can tell, this is the only in-universe reference to Kondo that survived into the animation since Ken Doi isn't a character here. You'd shame, really. Hanakoma holds up Joshua's phone to the camera, and we can see that his wallpaper is the art for his level 1 fusion. And the icon here looks like the one for Shiki's level 1 fusion, though that could just be a coincidence. Also, the error message that gets displayed mimics the style of the game's UI. While Neku gushes about Cat to Cat, we see the Tower Records ad for one of his albums, which must have some pretty serious stuff in it since it has the Parmental Advisory warning. Just like in the game, Hanakoma throws a title drop Neku's way, but unlike the game, Joshua's in the room for it. Joshua, true to his role in Neku's story, attempts to counter Hanakoma's claim and asks what happens if you grow and change for the worse. Hanakoma looks Joshua dead in the eye and says things can always change for the better as to not so subtly tell him, bro, you better not nuke this city. On the next day, to progress through a wall, Joshua bribes 777 and his band who are looking for their microphone, which is a much larger ordeal in the game involving betrayal and rejection. The two 
bandmates here are named Tenho and BJ. While 777 gives a rundown to Neku on where his precious microphone was last seen, a little text bubble appears in the exact style of the game. While Joshua is conversing with them, we can see the stride at the edge of the frame. The stride was a location where you could play a minigame called Ten Pin Slammer in the game, and outside of Shooter and Yammer's background cameos, there's your one morsel of Tin Pin for this show. We see players beyond the wall are fighting taboo noise, giving us our first look at the Carcinopunk, Death Metal Mink, and the Wall of Grizzly. Episode 6 is called Turf, just like the game's 12th chapter, which this episode is unique in the regard that it's pretty much the only day that's adapted here. It's also the best paced episode in the show, and you probably don't need me to tell you that in a perfect world, the whole anime would be more like this. After Neku's done accusing Joshua of a murder that he didn't did not did commit, the two spy on show making his taboo refinery sigil muttering the phrase, Sir, I bear a rhyme excelling in mystic force and magic spelling. <laughs> so that GM, that's weird. Quiet, he spot us. Which is what I believe is called a piem, or a poem used to memorize pi. The number of letters in each word is a digit of pi. At the start of the next day, when thinking about Shiki, Neku says that losing is not an option, which is a line that Shiki could say after finishing a fight in the game. Later on, Neku and Joshua are jumped by a doom metal drake. Interestingly, drake noise don't actually have their own noise symbol in the game, so the animators gave it one here. The symbol vaguely looks like the one seen when entering a battle in the game. When at Cat Street, we can see into one of the windows and see an... album? A stack of papers? A box? Uh... A thingy labeled Musanagi, which is the name of one of the Jupiter of the Monkey pins. They even have the same design. This is also about where the Jupiter of the Monkey store is in the game. Joshua tells Neku how separated the underground as a concept is, just like Neku, while this cool framing further illustrates that. Look, they're all like divided. Joshua then goes on to mention other Yuji's, specifically name dropping Shinjuku. Shinjuku's Yuji is given a greater focus in A New Day and Neo, and many thought that this mention was some sort of setup for that. But no, this mention is taken straight from the Japanese version of the game. It was changed for the international release. I imagine that it getting kept here in the English version of the anime though might have something to do with Neo. Maybe. When Joshua pulls out his phone later on, the screen is now fixed after Neku made him drop it and crack the screen earlier. The phone was still cracked at the start of the day, meaning that Hanakoma had to have fixed it when Joshua brought it in soon after. The episode ends with a battle against some trance rhinos. In episode 7, Joshua is able to deduce that the numbers show sent as a mission mail on this day were the square root of 5 and cites a mnemonic as the reason why. The mnemonic in question is likely a Japanese one about a parrot crying at the bottom of Mount Fuji. As Joshua explains the root system to Neku, a little map pops up to illustrate what he says. The map is identical to the one in the game. I mean, I know they're both based off a real place, but I mean the lines dividing the district are the same between both. In front of AMX, the two fight a small army of choir frogs, and afterward we see some chaotic core hogs attacking a group of reapers. And this is where I have to stop and report the missing. According to the animation's website, the pin superfine beam appears somewhere in episode 7, but after watching it over twice, I could not find it. Maybe I'm just being stupid, so if if any of you spot it, leave a comment. Otherwise, this pin is MIA. Before we dive into episode 8, let's talk about its thumbnail. The image used on a number of platforms is very clearly not from the world end of view. It's actually an image from the 21st episode of Back Arrow. I could not explain to you why it's been years and Funimation has still yet to fix this. And yes, I did watch the whole episode up until this frame appears. You're welcome. And no, I had no idea what was going on. After clearing the first mission in the episode, Neku gives Beat a rundown on exactly how he's getting screwed over this week, and Beat exclaims that Kitaniji is such a snake, an early foreshadowing to his noise form. The two begin to make their way to the Shibuya River, but the way there is guarded by a babop shark. Beat takes the opportunity to finally prove that sharks will not best him anymore. We cut over to the Dead Gods pad where Kitaniji is coming up with his plan for the week. He looks at his hand and says that the clock is ticking, foreshadowing the timer that Joshua put there. Later, when Konishi strolls up to stuff rhyme into her boobs, she enters from the shadows and a little appearing sound effect plays to foreshadow where she spends most of the week hiding. 
She does this a few more times throughout the week as well. Later on, Neku and Beat are attacked by a baritone reaper, as we can see by the color of his hood. This is opposed to a tenor reaper, such as BJ. The anime adds in a real fight against Triple Seven, now equipped with item drops from his dead friends. The fight sort of happens in the game, but it's just against a generic reaper, which I guess it's supposed to be him. Anyway, just like in the game, he's backed up by a number of happy core bats. Here they all converge into the shape of one larger bat, which I think is supposed to be an homage to Therapist Canner. Early into episode 9, we can see a little memorial for Beat and Rhyme, just like in the game. In the last video, I pointed out how cola is one of Beat's favorite drinks and that it was there along with a glass of milk, suggesting that milk may be one of Rhyme's favorite drinks. Here in the animation, however, the milk has been replaced with what I think is supposed to be the OJ item. I imagine this was changed so that they could rep more items from the game, but it also does imply that Rhyme is a fan of orange juice here. The OJ item as it looks in the game is seen later in the episode when Uzuki and Karya take a lunch break. You know, the anime did also change their favorite food from ramen to hot dog, so maybe there's like a theme here. In the next episode, we see a photo of Hanakoma fixing the Tabu Refinery sigil and it was modeled after the game's art of this same scene. Then we get our possessed Uzuki and Karya fight. During the battle, Neku shoots Uzuki square in the noggin and she begins to bleed. This is the first and only time in the series that we see someone in the Yuji bleed. Later, Hanakoma's letter warns the players to watch out for shadows. This is, of course, a reference to Konishi. A similar message was delivered to the two just before her boss fight in the game by Kitaniji. In episode 11, Neku and Beat sync up to take control of Noise Rhyme, giving her a new look and making her more powerful. I hereby die dub this as their level 4 fusion. Shiki strolls back up and states that Rhyme's entry fee was her dreams. Up until this point, this had never been confirmed. It was the most likely guess, but it took until the anime for her fee to be clarified. During Kitaneji's fight, he finds himself possessed by noise, drawing a parallel to Neku at the start of the show. This shows how Neku overcame his negative emotions that nearly consumed him three weeks prior. Now for the last episode! The episode is called It's a Wonderful World, which is the the same name as the series' Japanese title. We finally see Neku's full death play out in more detail and of course it's shot for shot like in the game. Down to Minamimoto's one line too. I blew it. I blew it. When Neku wakes up after the game he says Why? What the hell? In reference to this scene's iconic counterpart from the game. Why? What the hell? What the hell? This part of the episode also has a ton of cameos. Aside from the little spotlights on Death March, Soda, and Now, and Eri, as well as the repeat cameos of Shooter, Yammer, and Futoshi, we also see a number of shopkeepers from the game walking around here. We can see Shinta Iwata, Nana Majima, Yumi Shina slash Mi Suzuki, Fumi Gotada slash Tak Kumura, and Anna Aoi. When Shiki is shown here with her true appearance, her eyes are always kept hidden since the game didn't show them either. We see Makoto and I grabbing some boba together. If you're curious, it most closely resembles the boba milk tea from Neo, though I doubt that's an intentional reference. This shows that these two ended up much better here than the game left them. And in this timeline, Triple Seven actually gets his mic back. The final song played in this show is Underground from the game's soundtrack. What, you thought we were done? This job isn't done unless it's done thoroughly. The show's credits theme is called Carpe Diem and is sung by Asuka. The song and its music video contain a few references to The World Ends With You. First, the song's name means seize the day and its lyric contains the phrase just hold on to the moment. The music video contains imagery of people running through Shibuya like the players and Asuka herself sings the song into a megaphone just like our beloved math man. The song Teenage City Riot was also also composed for this show but was cut last second. The song did eventually get released and it along with its music video contain even more World Ends With You references. For the lyrics, it mentions the scramble crossing, noise, muffled voices, reapers, the phrase it's a wonderful world, surviving, not wasting your time or your life, and headphones. The music video has the lead singer Leo Imamura singing on a stage in front of an audience wearing angel wings. This of course represents Neku playing his game in one elaborate performance for the higher plane. Maybe this is the live action higher plane that I wanted to see all along. One of them even has headphones and another has a lollipop. Let that fuel all your Karya angel theories. The audience is mostly ignorant of him until the singer begins to sing about the lust for life, which is when all the angels begin to pay him attention. 
Negative attention, that is. It gets to the point where one of them pulls out this thing. This object may look unfamiliar to World Unto You fans, but it's actually supposed to be a gun. Turns out most guns don't typically look like hair dryers. Who knew? Anyway, he gets shot a lot with the paintball gun, which I want to say represents the alarming frequency of which Neku tends to get shot. Okay, I swear that we are almost done, but the very last thing that I want to do is cover some of the anime's promo art. The official website uses this art of all the good guys facing off against all the bad guys, and at the very top of it is an inversion from A New Day? I don't know why this is here. This is like the only concrete A New Day reference in this show. I'm convinced that they just saw the image in like a final remix trailer or something and thought it looked cool. Now for the art for this second box set. The image shows the main five with four of them taking a selfie. Joshua is excluded to show his isolationism. Next, there was this tapestry able to be won in Japan, which contains some unique art. Cheeky and Beat are doing their pose from their level 1 fusions. Joshua's art is based off when he pushes Neku off of Mark City and Rhymes is based off of a scene from the game where she erases Vespertilio Canner. And lastly, one of my favorite World Ends With You promo images. The original website background image and current streaming thumbnail. The image shows our main five surrounded by noise. Most are just kinda copy-pasted around, but they decided to have one shark noise framed above Rhyme. The coolest part of this art is with the shadows. These foreshadow that these kids are dead and represent all of them in various states of unwellness. Neku, for example, is sprawled out on the ground similar to how he was after Joshua shot him. Shiki, Joshua, and Beats are all of specific references too. Shiki and Joshua's shadow are based off of their sprites when taking damage, and Beats is based off of his art when Rhyme pushes him out of the way of the shark. As a final detail, all of their shadows have paint splatters on them to represent blood and solidify the death imagery. Well, all of them, except for Joshua. And now it's time for the final parts. Or at least it will be the last part until Square gives us a new game, or I hate myself enough to figure out how to make a video for a live remix or the Fieldwalk RPG. Oh my gosh, I'm never gonna be free from the series, am I? Well, whatever, consider this video a celebration because today is the 16th anniversary of the series as a whole and second anniversary of Neo. They grow up so fast. Well, unless this video gets re-released later in some sort of compilation, but why would I do that instead of making, like, the Shiki video I promised all the way back in summer? Completely ridiculous. Last time, we took a good long look at The World Ends With You, the animation, and learned how more care is put into its easter eggs and into giving it decent pacing. Today, we return to the realm of gaming and talk about Neo, The World Ends With You, the direct sequel to the original game. Or the anime, I guess, if you're Tetsuya Nomura. Why on earth did he say that? I gotta give the same exact disclaimers as I've done the previous two times. Since this is the final part, spoilers for the whole series. You better hurry up and play these games if you haven't, because sooner or later, I'm gonna run out of different ways to tell you to play them. Save me some trouble and just get it over with already, alright? If you're fresh off of having just played Neo, but are a little rusty and older material, I'll make sure to provide as much non-Neo context as is within reason. And disclaimer 2, we are dissecting the English localization of the game for reasons such as, I don't know what this says. And with all that out of the way, let's change our fate! I played this Steam port for the first time for this video, and because of that, I got all of the pre-order bonuses right off the bat. The most memorable of which are the Legendary Thread set. These are all the clothes worn by previous protagonist Neku Sakuraba, who also does appear in this game as a playable character, albeit with a different outfit. Most of these were thread items in the original game, although they now have a different name, stats, and branding. The tank top says that it was based off of the Jupiter of the Monkey bought a Dharma tank top. In the original game, the thread in question was just called Dharma. Instead of being a concept of order and stability like Dharma, bought a Dharma is the name of a Buddhist monk. The shorts notes that one of the buttons looks to have been reattached by hand. This is a result of an infamous scene in the first game where Shiki forces Neku to take his pants off so that she can repair them. All of these threads are branded to Jupiter of the Monkey. Jupiter of the Monkey, along with Natural Puppy and Tiger Punks, are returning brands from the first game, with all three never having gone out of style in a three-year-long 14-year gap between games. All of the new brands in the game still follow the Chinese Zodiac theming of their predecessors. That is to say, each brand is based off of an animal from or associated with the Chinese Zodiac. I'll talk about you later. 
The game opens with a text conversation between Rindo and Fret. Throughout the game, characters make frequent use of stickers, and Rindos are references to Final Fantasy creatures. And they're specifically modeled after their appearance in Final Fantasy VII Remake. We can see a Tonberry, a Chocobo Chick, a Moogle, a Carbuncle, and a Cactuar. The background that Rindo has on his Messenger app is the same design that he wears on his coat. While we're on his design, his hoodie is from the aforementioned Jupiter of the Monkey brand, meaning that both protagonists wear the same brand. Though, parts of his outfit definitely feel more Monaco to me, such as his face mask. Just like Neku wore headphones to represent Hear No Evil, Rindo wears a mask to represent Speak No Evil. Another homage to the proverb about the Four Wise Monkeys. Rindo wears a mask to represent his reluctance to take charge and properly lead others or even his own life. Don't worry buddy, we'll be fixing that over the course of the next 40 hours or so. As Rindo goes to meet with Fret, he bumps into a businessman. This is just a generic design that's used for a ton of NPCs in this game, but the hair and suits make him kind of look a lot like him Makoto Mickey from the first game, who is notably absent from this installment, and no, Square is not yet forgiven. Soon, Rindo gets a talking with his gamer girl GF about Fango, a cross between Final Fantasy and Pokemon Go. I imagine this is where all those stickers came from. Some of its creatures include the Nutkin, which first debuted in Final Fantasy V, and the Poopoo, which I, did I pronounce that right? Poopoo? Whatever, I'll just roll with it. Which first debuted in Final Fantasy VIII, along with the aforementioned Cactuar, which first debuted in Final Fantasy VI. The person he's talking to is Swallow, who will later be revealed to be the Reaper Shoka. She likely chose the name Swallow since it's an animal associated with Hanafuda. Hanafuda is a sort of Japanese playing card, and the Shinjuku Reapers all have aspects of their character centered around certain cards, usually determined by their birthday. In Shoka's case, the Swallow actually has nothing to do with her birthday, but the connection to Hanafuda was intentional, I swear. At the very least, her name contains the kanji for cherry blossoms, which are associated with her birth month of November. Rindo, who hails from Shibuya, has a name much more based upon the Chinese Zodiac, just like characters from the first game. His online name is Rin Dragon because he has the kanji for dragon in his name. He shares this trait with Joshua. Following this exchange, the game introduces the mechanic of mental notes, which is just the game's objective checklist. Interestingly, these fits really well with the lore we're given about Rindo in the secret reports where it's stated that Rindo is very good in taking other people's ideas and opinions to internalize. Basically, he's really good at keeping track of a lot of stuff, and that's here as a gameplay mechanic. Neat. As is just tradition at this point, a certain someone can't help but make an early cameo. Fret tosses a reaper pin over to Rindo, but Rindo totally fumbles the catch and it lands at someone's feet. This person picks up the pin and hands it back to Rindo. The person? is Joshua. Perhaps the curse is not yet over. As the two head into Dogenzaka for lunch, taking a detour to its back alleyway will let you find a piece of graffiti of Black Saturn. This is one of the darklit planet pins from the first game. The design also appears on the stairs in Utagawa. Swallow tells Rindo that she caught her nutkin in the scramble, and after all the chaos that ensues when Rindo and Fret go there to find her, the person that they run into first is Shoka. But before that, you might be able to notice that they're already starting to tune themselves into the UG upon leaving lunch. Aside from the support reaper that sort of just spawns as they leave the building, all of the NPC dialogue has been changed. Before lunch, Rindo was able to overhear bits of their conversation, but afterwards all of the text bubbles change to be thought bubbles. When the two do reach the scramble, there's a big focus on Rindo using Replay for the first time. But did you also know that Fret uses his latent ability Remind early? Right here. Whoa, it's like a movie about people who can do that thing. Uh, what's that called? You know, the brain power thing. What is that called? It's gonna drive me crazy. Come on, think. Oh. Psychokinesis? Bingo! We then get a first look at Shiba. I haven't really seen this mentioned elsewhere, so I can't 100% verify its credibility, but it seemed to check out to me. According to Twitter user at Bravado Kara, Shiba's design was based upon Japanese entertainer and host named Roland. The resemblance is especially clear when looking at early concepts for Shiba. Rindo also gets a pseudo-vision during this scene of what we will later learn is the final boss arena. And now we have our opening! Early on, we can see all the brands flash by super quickly. When the spotlight on Nagi happens, she trips, dropping all of her pins. 
Of the ones that we can see, there is Azamaru, Keisen Kanesada, and OMG Lightning. Afterwards, the opening focuses on Mina Mimoto. We transition to him via a wolf noise because shows a lone wolf. He then kicks down a bird, which is reminiscent of how one of his main goals in the game is to snag Rindo's time birds. He also does one of his signature poses. There's a shot where Kubo walks past Sugumi and smiles, which shows that this man is responsible for every bad thing that happened to her except for her poor characterization. The song used for this opening is a sort of mashup of a bunch of different songs from the game's soundtrack, and when beat is seen, this song shifts to Twister, the main theme from the first game. When we first see Shoka, she shows her phone screen to Rindo as foreshadowing to the reveal that she's the one on his phone! Then Neo turns into Persona 5 for a few seconds to pay homage to the game of which the concept of Shibuya originates from. The opening shows us Shiba fighting Rindo, only for Rindo to revert things and go back in time, which is exactly what winds up happening in the game's final chapters. After the opening is finished, Shoka hands Team New Kids their starter pins, which were amongst some of the pins Neku started with in the first game. We soon meet Susukichi, who speaks in references to Reversi, or maybe Othello sometimes. I had a hard time differentiating the two in my research, and so did all of human history apparently. Either way, it's a game with two players, one is light and one is dark. We enter our first battle, so let's take a moment to go over some of Fret's battle dialogue. He has a tendency to slip in references to popular songs during a fight. As an example, when using the Discord Dance or Maiden Beat pins, he can say, Feel the groove! In a reference to Cartouche's 1991 song, Feel the Groove. I want to say that Fret saying, Hey, take it easy! is a reference to The Eagles' 1972 single, Take It Easy. When guarding, Fret can say, Can't touch this! Just like in MC Hammer's 1990 single, You Can't Touch This. When Fret casts fire, he can say, Feel the heat! Just like the title of Jean Beauvoir's 1986 song. When Fret uses a water-based attack, he can say Splish Splash! In a reference to Bobby Darin's 1958 song Splish Splash. And when winning a fight, Fret can say Another one bites the dust! Which is the name of Queen's 1980 song. He also drops that last line again on week 2 day 4. Those are all the ones that I'm pretty confident in. That said, I do sincerely hope that Fret saying Let's get down to business when starting to remind is a reference to I'll make a man out of you from Mulan. Also, when casting wind, Fret can say whoosh in a likely reference to a nearly two decade old meme about missing a joke. Other characters do have the same line, but Fret in particular loves to reference memes just as much as he references music. Like how Fret refers to the concept of scanning as using his galaxy brain. This is a reference to the galaxy brain internet meme that originated back in 2017. Those may not be the only meme references Fret drops either. Well, actually they definitely aren't the only ones, but I'm just saying that for the sake of a segue into the next point. Uh, whatever. Right afterwards, Fret calls this support reaper sus. This is often attributed to be an Among Us reference, although it is worth noting that the word had significant popularity long before Inner Sloth's game became a cultural phenomenon. The word even appears in other thoughts throughout the game and in Final Remix, so I wouldn't actually call this an Among Us reference. That said, Fret does use it back to back with Imposter during week 2, and I refuse to believe that isn't intentional. Not too long after, we meet Mr. Minami himself, who is reintroduced along with a new remix of Transformation, his boss theme from the ports of the first game. Minamimoto is sporting a brand new design, including this jacket, which is actually the $1,800 croc pattern long jacket from the real-life brand Black Honey Chili Cookie. This brand also appears in the game as a shop, where all of its items are priced just as they are in real life. This cameo exists due to the friendship between its designer, Kei Takahara, and Nomura. Also, the shopkeeper, Hiromu Takahara, is an homage to him, with both having the same last name. Kei Takahara even voiced Hiromu Takahara in the Japanese version. Unfortunately, Takahara has since passed away. Back to show, he states that the game is 142,857. As Rindo points out, thanks to the power of Google, that is a cyclical number. Though the two don't know it yet, they'll soon learn that this game has no real end and continues to loop for as long as Shiba's in power. Sho famously calls his associates in this game Zeptograms. This is similar to how he called players in his game last time Yoctograms. A Zeptogram is ever so slightly larger than a yoctogram, so it seems that Sho has an ever so slightly better opinion of these two newbies. 
Minami Moto then expresses surprise at the player's abilities to utilize any pins that they come across. This is because in the first game you needed to have enough imagination to use certain psychs. In universe, it was explained that Neku was sort of cracked out because he could uniquely use them all. Since pins are equipable by everyone in this game, it's stated that the pins themselves just made themselves more accessible. There is this voice speaking over an aerial view of Shibuya. By digging into the game's code, it can be learned that this voice is Joshua. The next day, Rindo drops some primate facts and Fretz calls him Dr. Zoolittle in a reference to Hugh Lofting's century-old series of children books. This day also features this simp of a reaper who's like really into Shoka. He mentions wanting to buy her a big house, big cars, and big rings. This seems to be a reference to BTS, a South Korean boy band that mentions all three of those big items in at least three of their songs. Fretch names the team the Wicked Twisters. This keeps up his song referencing shtick, but this time he's referencing the in-universe song Twister. I believe this is also the first time that we hear Fretch's Quay voice line. He uses it as a substitute for what, likely due to Quay sounding a lot like the Spanish word que, which means what. Koi itself is the sound that chocobos make in Final Fantasy. On the third day, Sho claims that the Ruin Bringers don't play by the rules of rational numbers and that they are an aggregate function of a higher order, which foreshadows that they are all, in fact, Reapers. Also, if we're being honest here, their name is the Ruin Bringers. Did we think that they weren't going to try and destroy the city? On this day, you'll gain access to the Gatonero store. Of course, this brand was completely designed by Shiki and Eri, with Mr. Mew being their mascot. But as an extra detail, the denim cap, denim micro mini skirt, and mid calf boots are all evolutions of items that Shiki made for Aerie in the first game. Oh, and the bell sleeved two piece has a design that matches Aerie's necklace. After two days straight of not eating, you're finally able to go and grab a meal. An interesting observation is that Sho really likes sweet food. Aside from being a subversion, since sweet food is stereotypically seen as non masculine in Japanese media, developer comments clarify that Sho likes sweet food because the sugar keeps his brain active to run calculations. This day takes you to Tipsy Toe's Hall, and while there, you might come across an NPC who's running an errand for his boss. He was tasked with grabbing a fuse, but doesn't remember what a fuse is. All he remembers is that he got one in that game he played a while ago. This is all a reference to the first game's third day, where 777 tasked Futoshi with getting a fuse. This is actually a double easter egg since the title of the thought shares its name with the show Mission Impossible. Later, we can see a pin from the in-universe dating sim Elegant Strategy. The pin in question is of the character Tomonami, the apple of Nagi's eye. As is pointed out in game, Tomonami is very similar to Minamimoto. The name Tomonami is even two letters off from being an anagram of Minamimoto. This is the first day where we can meet Nagi. Her shirt has the otherworldly ability to constantly change What's written on it. Going off of translations by Reddit's user u slash kimchi who, here are the translations. Her main church says that her fave or waifu or other equivalent is the best. When she wins a fight, her shirt reads, Big Win. When diving, her shirt says, Pardon the intrusion. When she's not interested in a meal, the shirt will say, A different dish next time. When eating a meal that she likes, her shirt will say something along the lines of, Thank you for the meal. When eating something that causes her mouth to go into light show mode, her shirt says something like, I've decided to become a regular. When she's about to eat a meal, her shirt most likely says, House Special. And lastly, in battle, her shirt says, Expel Evil Special. Spirits. Oh, and because there's not really gonna be a better time to mention it, Nagi's birthday is July 27th, which is the release date for both the first World End View game and Neo. It's also today. Later on, when Fretch reacts to Nagi's hostility towards him, he says, And I oop, which is a meme originating from Jasmine Master's Handle Your Liquor video. This day is also the day when Rindo learns replay, and with it, the grand plan for him to generate the Soul Pulvis by storing dissonance and his Reaper pin be Begins. The Reaper pin design is noted to have changed throughout the story as more and more dissonance gets crammed into it. But not only does the pin design change, but the scan icon in the bottom right does too. This can first be seen at the start of the fourth day and continues to happen every time Rindo changes his fate. Oh, and now Nagi's playable. When casting a light spell, she can say, Oh, holy light! 
likely as an homage to Adolf Adams' A Holy Night from 1847. When doing a mashup, she can say, Let our powers combine! In a reference to the famous line from Captain Planet and the Planeteers. Let our powers combine! Oh, and when gaining groove with Fretz, he'll comment that her moves are like a boss. Just doing my job. Like a boss! This is both a song and a meme reference. The song is The Lonely Islands Like a Boss from 2008, which is titular phrase has since become a meme that I want to say eclipses the song itself. And as brought to my attention by commenter Yo371, when Nagi uses a support psych, she does the same pose as Jonathan Joestar from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure when he... Uh exists? I don't really remember actually. This is around the point where you'll first gain access to the social network and can unlock Minamimoto's node. Its unlock is hard mode, which is also what his sticker unlocked in the first game. Early into the fourth day, the player has the option of doing a side quest where they can help Aiji Oji remember how to solve one of his ramen issues. He says that he wants to recapture the taste of something that Sebastian used to make. Sebastian is a name that Ken Doi went by when he worked for the prince. Going off of the description of the meal given Given by Aji Oji's memory, he was most likely referring to Ramen Don's Mystic Ramen Meal from the first game, which has the same ingredient list as what Oji describes. The same meal can also be brought up in one of Dogenzaka's NPC's thoughts. The prince then remembers what he was missing from his recreations of the meal was love. This was the conclusion reached in the legendary Ramen Day of the first game's second week. Don Burrytown's assistant manager can also reference this when you browse the menu since this shop is also owned by Ken Doi. More on Ken Doi, he's now more widely known as the Don and is into curry. This is a reference to his real-life bassist, series head Tatsuya Kondo. In between entries, he developed a deep passion for curry, and that's now reflected within his self-insert. Tiger Punks is back from the first game and still carries some of its signature clothing items. The Red Mohawk set, Biker Jacket, Tiger Biker Vest, and Spike Choker are all from the first game. The Cotton Biker Vest is also back, just renamed to the Red Biker Vest. Same deal with the Tartan Coat being renamed to the Red Plaid Coat, the Skirt Bondage Combo being renamed to the skirted bondage pants, the bondage half pants being renamed to the bondage shorts, the white rubber soles being renamed to the white creepers, and the double spiked cuff being renamed to the spiked wristband. The patched biker jacket is an updated version of the patchy biker jacket. The bondage pants no longer specify that they are the black variation since there was and still is no other color option. And lastly, the white linen shirt looks to be part of the same series as the pink and gray gauze shirts from the first game, and it's item description mentions that the designer just sort of forgot to make a white one until now. And that's not all, because Natural Puppy is also back from the first game. The black jeans are back, my favorite one piece was revamped into the delightful dress, the lovely one piece had a ribbon added to it so it became called the lovely dress, the simple mules were renamed to the minimalistic mules, and the simple necktie was renamed to the standard tie. The lovely camisole has been renamed to the cute camisole, and its item description mentions mentions the same model wearing it in the same photo shoot that was mentioned in its item description from the first game. And that detail is shared with the Angelic Dress, a newer model of the Angelic One Piece. And while you're at Natural Puppy, getting max FSG and browsing around for a while will cause Kana to say that everything that Rindo buys becomes really popular for some reason. This is in reference to the trend system from the first game. When players in the UG wore clothes or pins, their associated brand would become more popular in the RG. This confirms that while the gameplay mechanic is no longer present, it is something that is still happening. Also, if you drop by Kony Kony, you can pick up the Petunia Pants and the Anthurium Boots, which descriptions imply that they're made as an homage to Eru. Everyone's favorite food item, air in a can, can technically be first acquired on this day. It costs 4,280 yen and somehow fills 428 calories. The numbers 4, 2, and 8 can be pronounced as Shibuya in Japanese. Fret back on his meme train, later says in response to the suggestion that he use Remind on himself, come on, that would never work.
unless. Which is likely a reference to the just kidding unless meme popularized by Twitter user at Indeprive when she tweeted, what if dot 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 put my Minecraft bed dot 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 next to yours dot dot ahaha comma just kidding dot dot unless dot dot question mark. In my replay of the game, this was around the point where I got the achievement for mastering 10 types of pins. The achievement is named 10 Pin Master and a possible reference to 10 Pin Slammer, a minigame from the first game. There are also around two NPCs in the game with thoughts related to it, as well as an esports team for the game made up of a couple of the shopkeepers which can be read about in the social network. This is the first day where you're able to snack at Kyoto Sweets and meet its shopkeeper Ryoko Kawahara. She has the same last name as Fuya Kawahara, leader of the Deep River Society. Should you unlock her node on the social network, it will tell you that she is married and did so for the money. Oh my gosh. You're able to go and pick up some new tunes at Tower Records this day, like the song New Game, the game's opening. The description reads that there's no stopping the countdown now. With that mix of song title and description, this is almost surely a reference to the multiple countdown teasers that have plagued the World Ends of View community for nearly a decade prior to the game's release. Full video on the corner. In places like Spain Hill or Takashita Street, you might come across a pin rack containing various pins from the first game. The pins are Ice Risers, Earthshake, which Spain Hill looks to have a defect version of, Blizzard Cool, Sexy D, Blown Kiss, Psychokinesis, Adamantite, Lazy Bomber, Meteor Magnet, Top Gear, Beauty Launcher, Bear Hug Magnum, Aqua Ghost, Burning Berry, Ninakiri, Mikazuki, Eyes Full of Hope, Kaleidoscope, Peaceful, and Thunder Rook. On day 5, the player first hears of the Paroxidols, an idol group really into sanitization and social distancing. Of course, they're all one big reference to COVID-19, which was most widespread during the game's development. It's also called out how Rindo's face mask is not a reference to COVID and is really just there for fashion. Later on, Rindo will have to give a few Deep River Societists a password. One of the wrong answer choices is Simple and Clean. Simple and Clean is the name of the original open opening song for Square Enix's Kingdom Hearts series, which is often closely associated with The World Ends With You. I'd play the song here, but I'm pretty confident that Yutada Hikaru herself would order a military strike on the channel if I did, so I'm just gonna not. Simple and Clean is also the name of the West Exit Bus Terminal location for Shepherd House. You player soon unlocks Kubo's node on the social network, which grants them the ability to chain together more noise at once. This is likely foreshadowing to Kubo's reveal as the Noise. Noise Master. Day 6 is the first day that you gain access to Utagawa. Cat's mural is still there along with all of its associated references. Actually, Cat seemed to have done some more work in between entries since his mural can be found in way more places now and with slight alterations like having the Shinjuku Reaper logo as a part of the design now instead of the Shibuya Reaper logo. But the most notable addition is right next to his main mural. There is the graffiti of a pair of headphones and angel wings that was shown at the final episode of the animation. This has got to be one of the few references to the animation in Neo. Some sequel turned out to be Hanamura. Well, except for maybe the song Act the Fool. This song is secretly an updated version of one of the anime songs turning. On the final day, Nagi swoons over Minamimoto for one of the final times. And in this instance, by actually saying the word swoon out loud, her affection is so strong that it manifests the Petals of Love pin out of nowhere. You finally gain access to Ryoji's shop on this day and can buy your first pin with a time psych. I note this since even though the first game didn't have affinities for their pins, no pin used a time-esque psych. But time-based attacks were used back then by Megumi Kitaniji. The player soon fights Susukichi for the first time and hears his boss boss theme were losing you. While most of the boss themes could be interpreted one way or another, this is one of the few songs that very clearly represents a character or story event. In this case, it's Susukichi and how he feels like he's losing Shiba and, by extension, his Shinjuku family. The day ends with Fuya's erasure and it keeps the same erasure effect for players from the animation, having him dissolve into balls of white light. Though how Reapers dissolve into both noise static and balls of white light is not kept up. Week 2 time! 
time. In the Koki Panic Shop, the Samurai Wig, Schnaz, Spectacles, and Santa Gear items are all returning ones from the first game. They just didn't have the Kroki Panic branding back then, and the Schnaz Spectacles were just called the Nose Glasses. Bet you the ones from the first game are off-brand knockoffs that just couldn't legally use the real name. While we're here, the Roller Skates item description references the musical Starlight Express and almost name drops it. Almost. Heading outside and scanning around Takashita Street will let you find someone thinking about how the last thing that they want to do is to be eating at Cutie Pies. They refer to it as their last supper, referencing a famous moment from the New Testament. Also, this thought has an almost title drop. Mixed with Breaking Free, this game has a tendency to put almost title drops in fairly random locations. At the end of the day, we hear the song Scramble in association with Sugami. While it now has different lyrics, Scramble is a new version of the song Shadow from Final Remix. Shadow was played as one of the main themes of A New Day, which featured Sugami's first real in-canon appearance. Wake up, baby. On that same note, Scramble is sold alongside the game's returning songs rather than its new ones. Upon arriving at Cat Street, scanning around might let you find a woman talking about being in Aijioji's fan club, The White Angels. The White Angels was the name of Aijioji's fan club that Shiki made in the first game's Another Day. Interestingly, this thought cannot happen in this game's Another Day. Just like with Tiger Punks and Natural Puppy, many of the Jupiter of the Monkey threads return from the first game. A lot of item renaming took place here, mostly due to what I guess was localization. Because items that were in both games got renamed in Neo to a different translation of the same reference. The Sutin was renamed to the Varuna t-shirt, when Sutin and Varuna are the exact same dude, and so are Amidaba and Amida, as well as Kamakutin and Virupakasa. Om and On are the exact same thing, and I already mentioned how Bodhidharma and Dharma are very similar. Inazuma means lightning, and in Neo the item is just called lightning shorts. And also the Gekurin sneakers, Karma shoulder bag, and Naraka rucksack all return from the first game with Fudo being renamed to Waterproof Hat. As for new references in the threads, the Maitreya jersey is named after a future Buddha, the Vaisvarana jacket is named after another one of the Buddhist Four Heavenly Kings, Skanda could refer to several Buddhist deities, Kambira is all of that according to the SMT wiki, Yama is a Hindu and Buddhist god of death, Kashana might be a weird spelling of Kashanti, a Buddhist virtue, and Samsara is a concept associated with karma that focuses more on the cyclicity of life. And not to leave Jupes' pins out, Maitaregami is named after a collection of mildly feminist poems written by Akiko Yosano to promote sexual freedom in 1901. Namikugiri sounds similar to Namagiri Thayar, a Buddhist goddess. Azamaru is named after another cursed sword. Then... Oh my gosh, okay. Shishio, Fuchin, Kusenegasaki, Takanosu, Iwatoshi, and Omakage all have names derived from Japanese railway stations. Oh my gosh, finally, that took way too many tries. Tenka Juzumaru is named after Juzumaru, one of the five best swords under heaven, or Tenka Goken. Another one of the swords is repped by the pin Tenka Mikazuki. Interestingly, Mikazuki was already the name of a pin in the first game. And a third is represented with the pin Onimaru. Kuroroshi is named after Kuroi Ushio, a 1950s novel by Yashui Inoue about the Shinomiya incident. Sayu Samoji is named after a sword, and that's the extent of what I can find on it. Aizen is the Japanese name of Ragaraja, a Buddhist deity. Yukimitsu is the name of another swordsmith. Tsurumaru is the name of another sword. Regetsu roughly translates to wonderful mouth. Hotaru literally means firefly. Kumokori is the name of a sword owned by Minamoto Yorimitsu. Taikokane roughly translates to golden drum, I think. And Keisen Kanasada was a sword made by someone from the Kanasada lineage, which inspired the name of a pin from the first game. The shopkeeper is also the same exact guy who ran it in the first game, Keiji Okada, or K1 for short. 
When failing to get to Not Neku in time, he ends up erased by Sugumi. Kubo is the one encouraging her to do it, and some of the dialogue that he uses is a little too similar to what Uzuki says to Neku in the first game when encouraging him to erase Shiki. Both even tell the other that they should just pretend like they're erasing noise. This is one of the few correlations between Neku and Sugumi that managed to survive into Neo after I imagine many more were planned for the original version of The World Ends With You 2. Uh, but I'm getting off topic. You'll soon first gain access to the second Shepherd House shop, and if you know what you're doing, that can eventually lead to you obtaining the pin back to the future. Continuing what I guess is a trend now for every game in the series to somehow reference back to the future. The second day ends with a battle against Mr. Mew. During the fight, Mr. Mew becomes giant and shoots lasers from his eyes. This, along with the nighttime cityscape in the background, is an exact recreation of Shiki's third tier fusion from the first game. And I'll be honest with you, this was in my notes for this part of the video, but I still would have totally forgotten to include it had it not been for the commenter Marisa Ma. The standard attacks done by the Mr. Mews are the Mr. Mew Cake and Mr. Mew Lariat from Final Remix's co-op mode. And the demon tide of an attack that the Mr. Mews do when they all come together is based off Shiki's second tier fusion. Now that beats playable, we can hear his new battle quotes. If you equip a fire pin onto him, he'll be able to say, FLAME ON! In a reference to the Human Torch from the Fantastic Four. As for his animations, his dodge is taken straight from Final Remix. Oh, also, if you equip Monaco's face mask on the beat, he'll wear it into battle. If you ask me, this should have been a feature for every clothing item for every character in the game, but I don't make the rules. As for his food taste, I checked to see if it was consistent with his likes from the first game. And yes, it is. In the first game, Beat tended to love all meals that were heavily meat-based and disliked most desserts. The same holds true in Neo. There really isn't a specific food item in the first game, that reappears in Neo, but Beat does hate the salad item from the first game and hates all of the salad at Veggie Lovers. The only thing that he tolerates there is air in a can. Finally, Beat freaking loves Kendo's curry in Neo. While curry wasn't available to eat in the first game, Beat did state numerous times throughout that game's another day how big of a fan he was of curry. Later on in day three, Fret says to Rindo, Ground control to Major Rindude, in a reference to Space Oddity by David Bowie. This detail was suggested by commenter Danny HSR underscore. I'm sorry I said your name so unconfidently. Moving forward a bit, Day 5 opens with a flashback of the Shinjuku crowd first arriving in Shibuya. The entire cutscene lacks the typical cut-ins used for just about all of Neo's other cutscenes since this one is trying to mimic the cutscene style of the first game. Also not an easter egg, but while I'm on the scene I may as well clear up a misconception. Shinjuku Reapers do still have wings, it just so happens that all of the named Shinjuku Reapers are officers which have hidden wings even in Shibuya. We later learn that Beat has never heard of the prince. Now while Beat is a little slow, he never actually met the prince in the first game or had any mission that revolved around him like Shiki or Joshua. Around this point is when you first gain access to the trick card psych from Monocro. The cards that it shoots out have an ESP or Zeno design on them just like Shiki's cards from the first game. Interestingly, the Gatornero trick cards pins don't do this, you know, the ones that would have actually been made by Shiki. On day 6, Rindo gets a vision of Moltoi being attacked by Shoka. In response to the attack, Fret says, Guess you should fear the Reapers. In a reference to the 1976 song by Blue Oyster Cult, Don't Fear the Reaper. Moltoi refers to Rindo as Mr. Twister. Mr. Twister is the person referred to in the song Twister. After all these years, we finally met Mr. Twister! Now to find out who that freak with a high kick is. During Moltoi's boss fight, he opens a fundraiser to get himself back up from a website called FundMe, please. A clear reference to GoFundMe. Following the fight, Kubo drops a quick reference to Of Mice and Men. And here's a fun one. Afterward, you unlock Moltoy's node on the social network. The ability that he grants is Noise Magnet. But this is also the same exact ability that his second-in-command Sumio gives. Moltoy just can't help but copy another. Next day, Shoka joins the party, and as she does, the player unlocks the stuck-in-the-middle pin as a subtle nod to the situation that Shoka finds herself in throughout the game. Now that Shoka's here, she has some references baked into her quotes as well. She can say, Get which is a 2011 meme originating from online gaming foreshadowing when she later comes out as a gamer. She can also say flock off, or as she pronounces it, flock off, to foreshadow her identity as Swallow. 
Lastly, she can say, I pretend I do not see it, when running away from battle as a reference to another meme. And now I can point out a detail with the game's battle animations. When doing a charge attack, Rindo, Shoka, and Nagi all have their poses based on those from Dragon Ball Z. Rindo does a Spirit Bomb pose, Nagi does a Kamehameha pose, and Shoka does a Masenko pose. I don't watch Dragon Ball, so I hope I got those right. The day ends with an introduction to our first noise form. If you recall from the first video in the series, I stated how all of the noise forms were determined from animals in the Chinese zodiac that are hidden in the names of the corresponding character. But like I mentioned with Shoka earlier, Shinjuku Reapers prefer to take inspiration from Hanafuda cards. Each card has a month associated with it, and the month that a Reaper's birthday falls under determines their noise form. In Sugumi's case, she was born on January 1st, and January is associated with the crane. That's why her noise form, Gruz Cantus, is a crane and is fought near construction cranes. I'd also like to mention that Sugumi is the only non-angel to have repeating numbers like that for her birthday. 1-1 one, one is an angel number. It's also New Year's Day, which I guess fits really well for her being from a new day. Following the fight, only two teams are left and Shiba states this is their last chance to impress him. While one of Shiba's speech patterns has always been for him to talk like a game show host, this line is actually a specific reference to a famous line from every episode of RuPaul's Drag Race. This was brought to my attention by commenters S Paper Garden B and Chemical Raven. Hey, 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 we have one more week to go. On the first day, we begin to see the effects of Shibuya Syndrome. While the game tells you that it causes people to become depressed, empty, or just flat out pass out, it also has the effect of changing people's Twitter handles to at down with the syndrome. First off, yes, every single person affected by this has the same exact Twitter handle, and two, this is a reference to the 2000s song by Disturbed, Down With The Sickness. And don't worry, my Twitter handle sing as that agent random to make it easier for you to follow me there. Bionic what? The, the frick is X? Seriously? Or Whose entry fee was that? Later, Karya drops a line explaining what he likes about Shibuya that's identical to one he dropped in the first game. On to the final second day. This day is called Dearly Beloved, which is also the name of Kingdom Hearts' iconic title screen music. This day is all about Ayano, and while searching for her, Shoka interrogates this Reaper and describes Ayano as someone with long hair and a mean RBF. In response, the Reaper asks if she's blonde. It's quickly brushed past, but if you stop to think about it, this Reaper is clearly getting to the description confused with Mitsuki Konishi from the first game. This man's an OG. Along the way to Ayano, there is this side quest where Eru thinks the prince called his voice detestable, while the prince actually thought it was delectable, like the spicy kick of masala. I bring this up solely because the prince famously makes another spicy food-based comparison in the first game when he tells Neku that he's dressed like a spicy tuna roll. This day concludes with a battle against Ayano's noise form, Iris Cantus. Just like with Tsugumi, she has the birthday correlation with the Hanafuda card. Ayano, being born on May 18th, corresponds with the Iris, which is represented by May. But she also has the word for Iris hidden in her name. Also, the Iris is Shibuya's official flower. Well, at least according to the Choi Wiki and Nagi in week 2. Google wasn't loading for me, so I couldn't find another source for that, but it would be pretty ironic for someone who hates Shibuya so much. During the boss fight, Ayano reminds us all that water is in fact bad for you, and in response, Fret says, ah, It's raining pain, my dudes! This is likely a reference to the 2014 Tumblr meme, It Is Wednesday, My Dudes. On the third day, Rindo orders an orange tea fizz from some drinks, and yes, the item is his favorite from the restaurant. Good observation. Later, or earlier, depending on how you want to look at things temporally speaking, Rindo tells Shoka that Fret can't use Remind on him while he's time traveling. In response, Shoka tells him, that's rough, buddy, in a reference to a meme from Avatar The Last Airbender. And Neku's back! His return is scored by Twister. The song is generally associated with him. Also, he has a haircut. I mentioned in the first video that his hair was lengthened in the first game's main story so that he can hide his face better. And it stayed the same in another day because he had been procrastinating on visiting his barber. But now in Neo, he finally has his shortened hair. His hair is still long in a new day, so I'm just gonna head canon that Coco had to spend some time giving him a haircut before sending him back to Shibuya. Just like with Beat, I checked to see if Neku's 
Neku's food taste was consistent with the first game. And yes again! In the first game, Neku was at least content with pretty much every food in the game, with only six getting on his bad side. And while they're different, there are also only six foods that he doesn't like in Neo. Also, dude still loves his chicken nuggies. His animations in battle will also be familiar to players of the first game. His charge, run, dodge, and showtime animations are all from the first entry. Around this point, you'll start running into grunge wolves. I note them since they share a name with the taboo wolf noise from the first game, but aside from that, they don't share any relation. The day leaves Shoka in a bad mood, which Nagi capitalizes on by shilling for her favorite game. We see some of the key art and can see that aside from Lord Tomonami being a mirror of show, the player character looks like Nagi and there's a character character that looks like Beat. Soon after, Uzuki begins texting with Rindo, the stickers that she likes to use to pick the bunny. And if you remember from the first video, I said that Uzuki has the kanji for the bunny hidden in her name. Y'all just wait, one day we will get that Uzuki bunny noise form. Just you wait. The day also has us see Fred and Nagi finally understand one another, and after the scene, the player is awarded with the pin Frosty Friendship, very on the nose. When going into the Shibuya stream on day 6, the player will obtain one of the pins from the year-long ensemble. The pins are named St. Vare's Uppercut, St. Astaw's Shrapnel, St. Autumnus's Strike, and St. Heim's Shotgun. These are all names of Roman deities. Vare is the personification of Spring, Astaw's is the personification of Summer, Autumnus is the personification of Autumn, and Himes is the personification of Winter. The description for each pin notes that they are all engraved with the text, Season's Greetings. The day's final boss is Susukichi in his noise form, Cerevis Cantus. Susukichi was born on October 13th, and October is associated with the deer, which is why his noise form is a deer. He also has the kanji for the word deer embedded in his name. Fear the deer. Also, this whole fight is an homage to Yodai Higashizawa's boss fight from the first game. It takes place in roughly the same location with a similar noise form and also has two phases, one where he sits and one where he stands. Also, they both take place in a dark and stormy time. Not long after, the battle against Shiba begins and while we don't see his noise form, we do see that his noise symbol is that of a butterfly, just like the pendant he always wears. He was born on June 21st and that that month represents the butterfly. Just before starting the inversion, Kubo refers to it as Showtime. This might not actually be an easter egg, but I'd like to think it's a possible reference to Persona 5 since Kubo is voiced by Xander Mobis who is also the voice of Joker. Also, I believe he does not call it Showtime in the Japanese version for what that's worth. Rindo tries the final day a few more times and we finally meet Rhyme. She has a new design that not only carries the same symbol as Beat's new design, but if you look closely, you can see that she still wears her pendant from the first game just under her clothes now. During this conversation, they bring up Reaper Creeper, which was a sort of minigame in the first game, and also Rhyme and Kaye have a little chat about Kaye's dream, which really resonates with Rhyme, likely because her dream was her still lost entry fee from the first game. When starting Operation Awakening, Neku uses the same pose and line that he uses when scanning in the original game. Focus. Focus. Of course, there have been a ton of recreated poses throughout the game for all of the returning characters. I didn't really find most of them notable enough to mention here, unlike in the anime, but I thought this one was particularly cool. Everything accumulates in the final fight of the Wicked Twisters versus Phoenix Cantus. Phoenix Cantus is supposed to be a representation of Haz's noise form. As far as I can tell, Haz lacks both the kanji for Phoenix in his name and his birthday has no correlation with Phoenix's. But he does have a Phoenix on his jacket. Jackets. Oh, and his birthday does use repeating numbers just like Hanakoma's, so it's an angel number, 5-5. Five, five. More on Phoenix Cantus though, it has a specific correlation with the final boss of the first game, Draco Cantus. That noise form was supposed to represent Joshua, and both the Phoenix and the Dragon are part of China's five heavenly beasts. The Phoenix and Dragon in particular tend to be used to represent Yin and Yang. As for the other three beasts, there is a turtle, snake, and tiger. You could maybe argue that Megzi Boys' noise form from the first game could represent the snake. As for other angels, Hanakoma's noise form is is a lion and a tiger, so that fits in. The only one that we haven't seen yet is a turtle. My bet's on Sugimi's brother, or just some other character that we haven't met yet. And the final detail for Phoenix Cantus is directly pointed out in the secret reports. It has as many tail feathers as times Rindo has activated replay. 
and I really hope we never have to fight the creature created from every time Fretz uses Remind. The song backing this boss is World Is Yours. This is another one of those few World Ends With You songs that actually represent a character in particular. In this case, it's Rindo. It even mentions a firebird. And not just that, but it was also the first song heard in the game's opening sequence. Chris Kid Joshua makes his big comeback on this day, and he does so by quoting Romeo and Juliet. This detail is only present in the game's guide, but his birthday was confirmed to be November 1st. His birthday digits are all repeating numbers, just like with Hanekoma and Haz. Kubo is the only angel who doesn't do this, with his birthday being on August 15th. 815 may not be an angel number, but it does belong to a different group of numbers. Numbers. And moreover on Joshua, when introducing himself, he repeats what he says to Neku in his introduction for the first game. Neku reunites with Shiki and the whole scene is a callback to the first game. Her waiting at Hachiko every day is what she said she would do if she made it back to the RG before him. Also, the pan up they do when she sees Neku again is the same sort of pan that they use to reveal most of her true form in the first game. The game ends with the title card changing to say, Neo, the world begins with you, just like happened at the ending of the first game. But the game isn't over yet! Let's finish it all out with another day! The day centers around all of our friends from the Wicked Twisters going to see a Death March concert. Now, if you remember, that was the name of Triple Seven's band from the first game. A few years later, the series composer Takaharu Ishimoto made his own album called Death March as an homage. A few more years later, in the anime, Triple Seven's band gets renamed to Death March. As we last heard, both groups are called Death March. But now here in Neo, we're hearing about Death March again. Which one is it? It's Ishimoto's band, but it's an in-universe one this time. But wait, there's more. If you dash over to Tower Records, you can see that the real-life album that Ishimoto made is being advertised, and this one is still called Death March? Not only that, but this easter egg is visible in the main story as well. Oh, and to top it all off, you can scan someone thinking that they should pick up the new Death March album, which can happen in both the main game and another day. Keep in mind that the game does actually block certain thoughts from appearing in another day if they reference a person or group not present in that day. For example, you can spot thoughts about Buddy Rapids in the main game, but not in another day. So what's up with this? The Zishimoto's band exists in the main timeline? Is it called Death March or Death March? Or is this person thinking about Triple Seven's band? Who knows if Triple Seven is even alive? He died in the main game, got revived in the anime version of the story, but still can't be spotted anywhere in Neo. So all of this leads me to conclude that I really need to stop thinking about this or my head's gonna explode. Neku mentions how Shibuya Palooza got pushed back several times before ellipses, well, everything. Seeing as another day was added in late in development, I'd say that it's safe to say that this is another reference to COVID-19. Beats mentions how he feels like he isn't getting much screen time, and Neku responds with telling him that it's the younger kid's time to shine. Leaning on the fourth wall a bit, since both Neku and Beat aren't really developed in the game, unlike the new playable characters, since they're developed came from the first game. It's spelled out pretty plainly here, but it's also prevalent as a more subtle theme in the game's main story. Anyway, the two decide to spend their off-screen time playing Tin Pin Slammer as a reference to how the first game's Another Day was all about Tin Pin. Neo really should have made It's Another Day about Alestra, and I will die on that hill. Nagi runs into Sugumi on this day, and the two begin fangirling over Ishimoto's music. Nagi mentions that his latest album is called Twister 2021 Tilda Fun in the Sun. Aside from being yet another reference to Twister, the fact that this version is denoted by both a year and a subtitle makes me think that this could possibly be in reference to the sheer magnitude of versions of Twister that have been made. Brett runs into Kanon and nearly gets scammed into buying some books that I'm not confident he's educated enough to read. Kanon offers them for 240 monthly payments of 10,000 yen, which would put Fret into 20 years of debt. The 20 years is an extremely obvious and intended reference to how long the wait between entries fell. One of the hidden events in Another Day is the Rhyme Dive sequence. There are a couple of noteworthy details here. Firstly, the dialogue choice confirming that you want to proceed with the scene says, Yeah, boy! Which is a meme originating from the 2015 video by Omega XL XL. The dive shows Rhyme's encounter with some Soul Pulvis remnants, hence why throughout she keeps referring to a black bird thing. 
This gives her visions of other timelines and realities. First, she mentions that she's falling and cries out to Beat as a reference to a scene from the first game's opening. Then she confesses to Beat that she was a spy the whole time, just like she does in the first game's Another Day. And lastly, she talks about flying as a noise, just like she did during the first game's story. Some of them don't actually have a clear reference, though. Makes you wonder what other worlds she saw into. And that is a wrap! Three videos, two games, one anime, every easter egg in the series. Well, I guess I left out how one piece of anime merch shows that shows online PFP is canonically just the digits of pi, but oh hey look, I mentioned it right there. Now that's everything. Wow, this has been a ton of work, but I'm really proud to have made it. Even just putting together this compilation was not an easy task. But hey, that's what I'm willing to do for all 5,000 of you. Holy frick, 5,000? Wow, thank you all so much. I can promise that everyone here on the team is totally blown away by the support. And we'll have wholly new content to share with you soon. But we'll share it with our extremely amazing and good-looking patrons a day early. Special thanks to Bacon King, Kazer, Nero Jacob Kurotama, Willpower784, Wonderland Snack, and The Missing Samurai. We are rapidly approaching the point where I am not able to do all of that in one breath. <laughs>